Hello everyone, wherever in the world you are. For some of you, it's early morning. For some of us sitting in Britain and Europe, this is early afternoon. For some of you in India, it's early evening. And for our first speaker, who is Rukshin, in Singapore, we're already into the mid-evening. And after the problems of last week, it is marvelous. We are all here and all systems go. So we're first going to ask Rukshin to give us her presentation and I'll ask her just to give a tiny introduction of herself. Okay, Rukshin. Okay, so uh, good evening everyone. Uh, my name is Dr. Rukshin Master. I um, am currently pursuing my PhD and uh, I'm practicing now in Singapore since the past one year. I'm also the coordinator for uh, the London School of Homeopathy here in Singapore. And uh, I'm here to share my views on the, the physical and mental aspects and its impact uh, on us post the COVID-19. So um, I would like to start my presentation now. Skype. Hi. Uh, I think everyone needs to mute their call because I can hear their voices. Yes, can we please all mute our microphone? Okay. So good evening everyone. Welcome to this much needed uh, webinar on the physical and mental aspects in our lives post the coronavirus. Now this virus has impacted each and every one of us in some way or the other. It's displaced so many of us, our aspirations, our, our thoughts, what we had expected for the future. There's so many uncertainties that are now encompassing every thought of us as to what about our jobs, Will life ever go back to normal? When will it go back to normal? How will we pay our future EMIs? And these insecurities and anxieties almost encompass every thought of ours. And for every one question that gets answered, there are 10 more questions that arise in our minds. Now fear and anxiety, I feel, is one of the most important impacts which the COVID-19 has had on our lives. Even those who did not have any mental health complaints before the COVID-19 have now started suffering from some form of mild fears and anxieties. And even though fears and anxieties are pretty common, it can sometimes become pathological and it's important to contain them before they start overruling every aspect of our lives. So let's discuss some of the common fears and anxieties that we are all going through right now. So there's a fear of infection. That's there in every one of our minds. Every time we go out, we want to wash our hands for 10 minutes as soon as we come back home. We're sanitizing our hands every time we're out, every 15 to 20 minutes. We're scared of touching anything. We're scared of someone talking to us. We're scared of someone looking at us. There's a fear of the coronavirus, of course, but there's also fear of other diseases because we know that if we get any infection, even besides the coronavirus at this point of time, our chances of complications due to the coronavirus increase. And so everyone is scared even of sneezing. We have a strong fear of hospitals. We've all developed fears of getting the wrong treatment, going under the doctor, going under the ventilator. And these are just some of the top layer fears. And then we have these underlying fears that every one of us is thinking in some form of the other. A lot of people due to the coronavirus have been impacted with their employment. They've lost their jobs or they've had pay cuts in some form or the other. 
and everyone thus is scared as to how will they make the next payments how will they pay their children's fees and there's a fear of poverty everyone is scared of losing the money that they already have on some form of treatment or due to any other unforeseen circumstance and all of this has eventually led to a fear of the future no one knows what's in store in the next few months everyone has some amount of uncertainty which is there in their minds and this has led to even more fears so now we are fearful of shaking someone's hand of touching anyone we're scared for the health of our elderly for our parents we're always worried about our grandparents or our relatives we are very fearful when we have to go into crowds having someone even 1 meter at a distance of us makes us a little antsy and of course everyone now is scared of flying because they know that if they're all together in an aircraft there's some form of infection that they will be able to catch and also eventually some of us are also now scared of the government because we don't know what they have in store for us for the future so let's first discuss a few remedies that come up very strongly with fears and anxieties now even though anxiety if you go in the repertory has hundreds of remedies under it there are a few that definitely strike out a little more than others so let's just very superficially go through a few headlines of them so the arsenic iod anxiety you generally see it in cachytic appearance patients who are very thin very anxious they have low appetites and an inactive digestion whereas the arsenic album anxiety on the other hand he's more restless more irritable with the anxiety there's a lot of anguish that's present and eventually melancholy now the aconite anxiety aconite is also very anxious also very restless and they have a full pulse kali ars has a strong anxiety about health also a very chilly remedy but it manifests its anxiety in the form of being quarrelsome and violent argentum nitricum which we all know has a strong anticipatory anxiety and very impulsive in his decisions kalikarb is very hypersensitive very irritable with his anxiety very rigid with his thoughts and a constant fear of some impending disease platina on the other hand is a very different picture she is more haughty more hypersexual with her anxiety and there's a strong fear of death so what i will now do is try to again differentiate a few more remedies in the aspect of their etiology that is what causes the anxiety and how they manifest their anxiety so i've selected six remedies for this differential diagnosis of anxiety So let's start with arsenic alb. Generally, with them, you see an ailments from some sort of grief, or a fright, or a fit of passion. Whereas in calcarea carb, the anxiety comes from any kind of fright or mental strain. Carcinosin, on the other hand, develops anxiety after a prolonged history of a suppression of either anger, suppression of their irritability. fear and fright or some long standing unhappiness let's look at phosphorus phosphorus on the other hand has an ailments from anger grief fear worry mental exertion over prolonged periods of time and any strong emotion pulsatilla on the other hand has anxiety after grief after there's some episode of mortification or sorrow and after their menses are suppressed serinum on the other hand has an ailments from mental labor suppression of their skin disease anticipation emotional excitement or any mental etiology like the loss of wealth property and relationship and this applies very strongly now because a lot of people have a fear of poverty at this point of time due to losing their jobs and how do these six remedies manifest their anxiety 
So I'll just go through it very superficially. Arsenical will manifest it as an anxiety for health. You'll become fastidious. You'll see panic attacks, fear of death, fear of cancer, fear of heart disease. Calcarea carb, on the other hand, with anxiety, needs security. He needs someone to protect him all the time. He will want to only stay at home. He doesn't want to get out because that is his safe zone. He gets overwhelmed and starts seeking protection. You see night terrors. They need support. They have a despair also of recovery and a strong sense of duty and responsibility. Then you have a guilty feeling. They refuse to be controlled. Delusions, self-sacrifice, sentimental, sympathetic, romantic. They have a desire to travel. Loves dancing and loves animals. All these form strong traits of carcinosin. Phosphorus, on the other hand, when he gets anxious, gets very loquacious and wants to keep talking, keep talking, keep talking. Pulsatilla, on the complete opposite spectrum, wants to please, cannot refuse anything, but gives only to receive, places responsibility on others, can get manipulative to get some attention. They have a strong forsaken feeling, feeling of being neglected, start craving consolation. They like it if someone comes and sits next to them and tries to talk about every single problem that they have. Very rigid religious ideas, excessive praying, demanding, again for attention, very timid and consolation ameliorates. And lastly, serenum. Serenum gets very anxious, very fearful, gets suicidal. There's an anxious and a hopeless disposition that you see in Sarainam. They've completely lost hope from every point in life. So there's a strong depression. Hopelessness is what we see. Fears that either he will die or he will fail in his business. Strong fear of poverty. Fear of not being loved. And a fear of failure. And there are many, many more such remedies which could be differentiated for their anxiety. But the remedy which I wish to discuss today in a little more detail is a remedy which I have also prescribed a lot in the last few weeks, which is arsenicum album. But before we get to that, let's discuss a little bit about how one would differentiate the rubrics of fear, anxiety, anguish and phobia. All these seem to come a little close to each other. But if you look at the repertory under fear of dark, and then you can see another rubric called anxiety in the dark. And so you should know which rubric to take for what symptom. And thus the meaning of that becomes very important. So let me give you a small example. Let's say you're walking in the forest. The sun is shining above you. You have a calm mind. You have happy thoughts. You're walking. And suddenly, out of nowhere, appears a rattlesnake. There's a sudden sense of physical, physical symptoms that start appearing. Your heart starts racing, you freeze, you start sweating. This is fear. Now, you pass by that event and a month later, you're walking in the same forest. The sun is again shining. Everything is exactly the same as it was. And the snake isn't there. But when you pass by, you start experiencing symptoms of nervousness. You, start, you suddenly start remembering the previous episode when you saw the snake and you get a certain set of symptoms and feelings. This is anxiety. So fear and anxiety need to be differentiated also for the purpose of diagnosis of anxiety disorders. But the truth is sometimes the line between fear and anxiety can get a little thin and fuzzy. A region in the brain 
which we call the amygdala, is the one which connected both those events, forming an unconscious memory of the association. So even when there was a neutral stimulus, just the rock or just the trees, which later occurred, it automatically activated the amygdala, thinking that there was some form of danger and eliciting fear and triggering worry, which we called anxiety. So it was a very auto automatic activation that took place. And that reflects the fact that the amygdala works outside our conscious awareness. We first respond to the danger and only afterwards realize that the danger is present. So to put it in short, fear is when there is a presence of stimulus, whereas anxiety is even present in the absence of the stimulus, which in our example was the snake. Fear, I would probably label as a negative-ish state. And why I would say that is because it could also be a constructive. So fear stimulates your fight and flight response. And this is something which we've been experiencing since the time of our ancestors. When they would look into the eye of the tiger or face the animals dead on and either they face them or they run away. But that experience at the end of it can teach you something. You can evolve and you can progress from your fear only to come out stronger on the other side. Whereas anxiety is generally always a negative emotion because it was it will always hamper your growth in some form or the other by constantly dwelling itself on certain repetitive thoughts in your mind. Anguish. Anguish, on the other hand, is a more severe form of anxiety. And anguish always is accompanied by these certain physical symptoms like sweating, racing pulse, you feel suffocated, you feel defenseless and powerless to that danger and you start showing signs even of muscle tension and have difficulty breathing or even digesting your food. So as you can see, this is a very severe form of the anxiety that takes place, which not only, aspect, not only has mental aspects, but also has physical aspects. And now phobia. Phobia is fear of any specific thing. So you can have a fear of, of water, so which would be your hydrophobia, or a fear of dogs, which would be cyanophobia, or a fear of airplanes, which would be aerophobia. And we have many of these as rubrics in our repertory. So I think this gives us a little bit of a better understanding when we're dealing with fear and anxiety. So let's quickly start off with arsenic alb in fears and anxieties. So arsenic alb, as we all know, uh, what we use is the white oxide uh, uh, for the preparation of the remedy. And the part that is the sphere of action in the mental aspect of arsenic album would be your hippocampus and your amygdala. And what do these two parts control? They normally have anxiety disorders, OCD, post-traumatic stress, personality disorder, hyperactivity, social phobia, bipolar disorder. They're known to trigger fear and are responsible for memory and learning disorders. Now, how do we know that arsenic alb affects these two areas? Well, for that, we have to sometimes look at the poisoning symptoms. So when we look at certain poisoning symptoms of arsenic album, we see that the arsenic is known to affect the hippocampus and the amygdala in many animal studies. So let's look at this, for example, one of these studies, which talks about the effect of arsenic exposure on neurological and cognitive dysfunction in humans as well as rodent studies. I will just go through this very superficially. So this review focuses on the current epidemiological evidence in children and adults with emphasis on all mood disorders and neurological complaints. So a number of studies have shown that arsenic induces 
cognitive deficits in children, even at low concentrations, poor performance and scores on the verbal IQ, cognitive dysfunction. It alters the growth and development, leading to neurological deficits. Even a 2004 cross-sectional study showed that with low arsenic exposure, those people are known to have poor mental health, particularly depression. So the conclusion of the study was that toxic exposures to arsenic results in memory loss and emotional instability. Arsenic toxicity affects multiple symptoms and specific pathways involved in several aspects of learning, memory, movement, decision making and mood. So what we notice and see from these studies is that the symptoms which Dr. Hanneman got in his provings 200 years back are more or less similar to what we now see even in 2014 in the studies that are coming up which helps us correlate and understand exactly where is arsenic uh, attaching its effect and how we are then seeing the manifestations of that arsenic exposure. So let's start with the symptoms of arsenic alb. What is the key delusion? The key delusion always is that they are sick. He feels it in his gut. He knows that something is wrong with him. He constantly wants to get himself checked by the doctor. He's always in those thoughts that probably if I went out today, did I catch the virus from my taxi driver? Or did that person walking too close to me touch me? Or did the supermarket uh, lady while handing me my change back, did she spread the virus to me? And he'll keep dwelling on those thoughts over and over and over again, constantly thinking that he's caught some infection and that now he is going to be sick. And with arsenic alb, what happens is that it is always a life-threatening illness. It is never that, oh, I caught a cold and a cough. It's always fear of grave diseases that will somewhere or the other lead to his death. So it's always end stage. So the thoughts that go on in the mind of arsenic. What is the death rate of my disease? Who will take care of me? Which doctor should I go to next? I will die. What if this happens and what if that happens? And he keeps thinking that nothing will work. So the fear that comes out the strongest with arsenic alb would of course be cancer because somewhere everyone associates cancer with eventually having a shorter lifespan. So he always feels that he has end stage cancer and now he is going to die. Now with arsenic alb, it is more than fear. It is anguish, which is what we discussed, which is the physical symptoms associated with the anxiety which is tremors, he cannot eat properly, he starts sweating, and all of these become a syphilitic expression of an otherwise soric remedy. So this anguish leads to pessimism, which is a kind of a negative attitude which he has all the time. Irresolution, irritability, and it even leads to hostility if not taken seriously. So what we see commonly in ourselves is hypochondriasis. Hypochondriasis, which we all know, is a fixed idea that one suffers from some incurable disease that no physician has yet discovered the cure to. But all of us at some point or the other can be a little hypochondriacal where we feel like, oh, this cough isn't going. Could it be something more than that? But with ourselves, it isn't just that much. It's much more than that. He keeps thinking about it, keeps thinking about it, keeps thinking, oh, if I have a cough, it must most likely be lung cancer. And he starts dwelling on the very insignificant aspects of his health. So at any given time, he feels he's either dying of a brain cancer or a stomach cancer or multiple sclerosis. And there's a fear of death and anxiety for salvation. So for example, if the RSALP comes to you with his tests and you say, oh, your tests are pretty good. 
he would be like, no doctor, there's something missing. Can I go and show it to some other doctor? Can I do so-and-so test? Maybe the lab laboratory did not do a correct uh, um, diagnosis on it. Should I repeat the test? And these kind of thoughts will keep going on in his mind. When one ailment is dismissed by his physician, he will immediately rush to Google and try to Google what diagnosis he has. And then we all know Google always shows up as cancer. So he's even more convinced that he now has cancer. And even if he improves by 90% with your remedy, he will still go and focus only on that 10% and declare that he has not improved at all. And another reason why that happens is because Arsenic Alb wants perfection. He wants to see himself cured that 100%. So you see a fear of suffering. You see a despair of any recovery. And the always present threat of some form of imminent death. So what does he look for? He looks for those magic cures, miracle cures, or those spiritual healers who say that, you know, you come to us and we'll completely rid you of all, our com all your complaints. And so he goes from one person to the next, to the next, to the next, just awaiting for that one person to completely rid him of all his complaints. So what are the other fears besides the fear of health, which we see in arsenic? There's a fear of poverty and there's a fear of starvation. Poverty also because he feels like going from one doctor to the other to the other leads him to lose a lot of money. And so he eventually feels his health will drain off all the savings that he has and he might land up being poor or he might land up starving himself and his family. So what are some of the delusions that we see in this aspect? So we see a delusion of he sees dead people. He wants to hang himself, sees phantoms, sees insects. He's neglected his duty, which is something we'll discuss later. Delusions, he has offended people. Delusions, people are besides him. Delusion rats, delusion religious. He has a delusion he's sick and he sees ghosts day and night. Eventually, due to these compelling thoughts of anxiety, of uh, anguish, when no form of support is found, a deep sense of depression sets in. He starts feeling uncomfortable. He takes pleasure in nothing. The least thing troubles him and he has a very hypersensitive, delicate mood. So he gets offended very easily. You can just say the smallest of things and arsenic alb will suddenly blow up. His mind is depressed and there's a great sense of despondency and indifference that follows. So with regards to company, we see one mark symptoms, which are all aversion to company. So there's an aversion to company with a fear of being alone. There's an aversion to company at the sight of people he wants to avoid. And there's one rubric which says desire for company when he's alone, but yet he's fearful of people. In two marks, you see arsenic under company ameliorates. And in three marks, you see arsenic for company desire and company desire when they are alone. So this kind of a totality is sometimes important because it helps us understand that it's not always an aversion to company which ourselves has, but we can also see a company ameliorates and a company desires for. So how else do they compensate? A person who's so anxious, a person who has so much of, of, of anguish going on in his mind all the time, he wants to keep talking, keep talking and keep talking. He wants to talk about his health. He wants to talk about the latest discoveries, which is the new vitamin. So in this situation, he's updated on every medicine that has come out for coronavirus, whether the zinc health or the calcium health or the hydroxychloroquine health. He's aware of everything. And he will go to a point where he might even wake his family up from their sleep to talk to them about these concerns. So we see a loquacity while awake and we see a loquacity in his sleep. 
Now we come to the little negative aspect of uh, arsenic to the point where he can get malicious. He starts getting cruel on animals, on people. And all of this is because of the instability that is present in his mind. And eventually what we see is a mental fatigue. So the Arsal now has completely lost focus on what he is supposed to do in life. He isn't able to even perform his day-to-day -day routine activities correctly. He's constantly preoccupied by those thoughts. And there's a sense of mental exhaustion. There's a weariness that seems out of proportion to the effort that the Arsal person has to put forth. And this eventually leads to irresolution and procrastination. So they feel so now why does this irresolution happen is important to understand. So what happens is our self needs to be perfect. He needs to be 100% in everything. And because of that, he has to weigh all the options before he makes a decision. And then let's say somehow he makes a decision. He always regrets the decision he made because he is not sure what his life would have been like had he taken another decision. And so he reproaches himself. And there's regret and there's self-blame. And that eventually again leads to despair of life. He starts feeling a lot of guilt, anxiety of conscious as if guilty of a crime. So he feels like the wrong decision that he made is as good as committing a crime. And he's full of worries, very unhappy. And rather than yielding better results, what he does is the next time he has to make a decision, he procrastinates because he doesn't want to go through this entire cycle of regret and reproach and guilt. Now, this is an aspect of ourselves that we are all very well uh, averse with, which is their fastidiousness. So they want to become high achievers. They want to be perfectionists. They want to be neat and clean and meticulous with everything. And they have a great eye for detail. They have a love for every form of order and symmetry. And the cleanliness is not like a cleanliness that you and me have. It's a fanatical cleanliness. So for example, you will see some of these uh, behaviors which is a ritualistic hand wash washing. So they have a particular pattern in which the entire hand wash has to happen. It can't happen this way first and that way later. It has to go in their particular method. Cleaning the house all the time, cleaning their desks all the time, planning every single action on paper. Everything has to be written down meticulously. Schedules, and he'll not only make his schedules, but he'll also make his family schedules just to see that everyone is doing everything as per his uh, planning. Stocking of the refrigerator. So the most likely the tissue rolls and the toilet rolls that got over was all taken by uh, Mr. Arsenic Al because he has this need for stocking because he feels insecure that he might at some point need more and if he doesn't have more, it'll make him, it'll trouble him a lot. So he needs to stock everything and everything has to be stocked methodically, neatly, if there are bottles, they have to face a particular way. He'll be the one who brings his own silverware to restaurants, organizing every single item in the house with their name tags. And when they visit the homeopath, writing 26 pages of complaints because they have a lot to talk about. So for example, when we talk about this cleanliness and a particular hand ritual, you can see this image which shows that this man is washing his hands and then he wipes his hands. But when he wipes his hands, he realizes he might have dirtied them again. So he again has to wash his hands. And so the cycle continues. And so why does Arsad feel the need to do all this? Is because of his consciousness that he feels and his conscientiousness. He wants to strive for 100% and nothing less than that. And therefore, in most of the situations, he's always doomed to fail. So we spoke about the cleanliness aspect of ourselves. Now this cleanliness is also based upon arsenic's desire for absolute security. 
something which he can fall back to in case of disasters. So for the process of cleaning, it makes arsenic feel like he has achieved something small in an unmanageable world. And he doesn't only do this with himself, but he also imposes this behavior on his family members, which can sometimes become very suffocating. And eventually, all these emotions turn into anger because perfection is unattainable. And so he gets frustrated. And this he shows in the form of dissatisfaction and being angry with himself, being bitter with others all the time. And finally, death, which forms a very important aspect of arsenical, which is ailments from death of loved ones. We see ailments from death of loved ones children in. There's an agony before the death. There's a conviction of death. They might even desire death. There's a presentiment of death, sensation of death, thoughts of death, fear of death. Especially in the night, during the midnight, which we all know is a modality for ourselves. Especially when they're alone, they start fearing death. Fear death of bed going to, impeding death, fear of death pain from, fear of death fixation after, waking on. They have dreams of death. And they feel a sense of weakness when death is approaching. So this irrational fear of death is outspoken. And it results, why? Because they feel like they have failed to live. They have a guilty conscience because they feel they have wasted their life and missed opportunities in life to do something productive. They feel like their life was in vain. They feel they haven't lived. And these thoughts are unbearable. But it's become his fate. Why? because of his sterile approach to life. Because he never found true pleasure and true happiness because of this constant fear that was present in his mind. So I think this gives you a small gist of the picture of arsenic album during the times of anxiety. And even though he is a very difficult person to deal with as a family member, as a patient, giving the remedy, can really work wonders. So I hope you all uh, found this use uh, this remedy useful. And that's the end of my presentation. Good. And uh, Rukshin, thank you very much indeed. Um, somebody has asked me while you were talking, can you make the slides available? Yeah, sure. Uh, okay, so everybody can hear that, that these slides will be available afterwards. They'll be put on the LCH site, I expect. Yes, yes. And um, now look, uh, we have had a very full presentation there. Does anyone have a really urgent question from this talk before we go to our next speaker? So Dr. Sandeep, is anything coming through as an urgent question? I don't think so. I think we can move to the next speaker. That's very good. Right. Well, when I did the, uh, introduce this seminar, I forgot to tell you all that I'm Roger Savage sitting here uh, in England. Um, there are even more people in now than when we started, which is fantastic. A worldwide webinar. So we are now going to move to our next speaker, who is Antoinette Byrne who is just a hundred or so miles west of me in Ireland. So Antoinette, would you please unmute your microphone and put your video on? And I'm going to put my picture off. And Antoinette, would you please just very briefly introduce yourself and then um, share the screen and we'll look forward to your presentation. Thank you. Yes, yeah, thank you, Roger. Thank you very much, Dr. And also, I very much enjoyed that presentation. Um, so I'm just going to share my screen on my presentation today. 
Um, I'm a homeopath based in Ireland. I trained in Ireland and England also. Um, I spent some time in India and um, have had uh, great experiences with um, homeopathy and helping people with um, anxiety. So one of the remedy, um, if you like, uh, the remedy families that I have liked to use during the time of COVID-19 is the matrodonal remedy. And the reason that I like to use these is because at the very beginning of um, the COVID-19, people were told that they, they must protect themselves and go into lockdown. And this caused an awful, it's absolutely huge panic in people that we saw that they were um, going and panic buying things in the markets. And there was a huge, huge fear that came up in people. And this actually reminds me of a proving that um, we had done in a group. And there was two sides to the proving. So, um, so yeah, basically the fear of the, the pandemic caused this huge anxiety in people to retreat back to their own homes for their protection and safety. And in doing so, um, people had to move, if you like, from uh, where they had built up their um, their knowledge and their work and promotions and really built the homes for themselves and had to come back maybe to their their actual um, childhood home uh, to have that protection and to have that nourishment um, that they were forced basically from loss of jobs and closure of businesses and some of them were thrown out actually of their, their homes uh, because the landlords maybe wanted their friends Back to living in themselves. So it was a huge anxiety at this time. So this is me of the proving of placenta. And these are the experiences that we saw. And if you like on the left side is the um, very comfortable and uh, the positive side of the uh, of placenta by the tractor. On the right hand side we see that there's a more negative, uncomfortable side of proving the placenta that I was involved in. So on the left hand side, here are the people that are going into their homes and they're very comfortable. And saying, yeah, that's okay. Yeah. Antoinette, I'm sorry to interrupt. People are sending me messages that the sound isn't very clear. There's a bit of disturbance. Could you please speak just a little slower? Oh, okay. It, I think I think there is there is some echo echo going on. It's not only that. There's a little bit of distortion. I'm sorry to interrupt, but it was causing a problem. Okay. Okay, I'll keep going, and hopefully um, right. it will okay. be okay. Yeah. So on the left hand side of the screen, we have the more positive aspects of the center remedy, and on the right hand side, we have the more negative aspects. So on the left hand side is where the people have gone into their houses, into the cocooning experiences or the isolation. And they feel happy to be there and they're uncomfortable. And then on the right hand side, you feel how they're very uncomfortable. And here is the fear side of it. So where am I going to get my food? And it's so dark and I'm terrified. And where is everyone? Because everyone else has gone into the homes and the connection then is lost. So where we have gone from having a connection with people and feeling very loved, we are now in the disconnection and feeling unloved and maybe thrown out of the homes, thrown out of our jobs. And it sometimes are violent nightmares, which can be seen in the potential remedy. And there's anger and um, lashing out. So the other side, again, is the calm of being at home. So, in the physical symptoms, we have a sensation of heaviness that they can't get out of bed. And the more weighted, it, it can be thought of as depression, but it's a more weighted feeling uh, that they're so tired and they're yawning all the time and they want extra sleep. And that is the, um, the depression sensation with this uh, the remedy. Um, there have been a few beautiful cases which I have given presented to of uh, people that have had to move home uh, to the family home uh, during this time of COVID-19 because maybe they have um, not been able to keep their jobs or they have had to move country. And these are the, the symptoms that they have displayed, the sensation of 
uh, not and where are they going to if you have their nourishment and what are they going to do and a real heaviness to it as well a very much heaviness like I don't want to get out of bed and there has been one person uh, that said that they they had violent uh, nightmares and when we think about the placenta it's not only this generation as well and especially for women it's the generations that go before that so when a woman is pregnant she is carrying her child but also the ovaries are forming for the grandchild as well so um it's sometimes in this period where we have nothing else to think about the underlying aspects of the generational trauma can be seen coming through as well and that's where placenta is a lovely remedy um, to use um, and i've had lovely um, success where people have felt better after having maybe traumatic experience at home, uh, where they have felt better after taking the center so that they're able to actually go out into the outside environment, even just for a walk, where they haven't before. Uh, the next remedy in the series of the transition remedies is aqua amniotum humana. So this is amniotic fluid, and it is a water remedy. So we water remedies, we see that there's um, a grief element through the water remedies, it's all about flow as well. And um, when we think about fear, we must think about the kidneys because it's the kidneys that hold the fear as well in the body. So this is the area of the body where the fear is held, the kidneys. And when we think of aqua amniota, amniotic fluid, um, the fetus will actually drink uh, some of the amniotic fluid which goes through the kidneys and that uh, comes back again. So there's an exchange and a flow. And um, there is, of course, this is the transition remedy again, but there's an anxiety in aqua amniota humana about moving forward. So what we're seeing is people are inside the womb, if you like, and they're floating around the water and they're lovely um, and happy, but they need to put their toe outside the water to see what it's like outside. But there's a huge anxiety in that. Now, while people, I see this remedy as well for people that are inside in the home. And when they're inside in the home, they start gathering information. So they're anxious about moving forward, but they start gathering the information about how can I move forward? Because I can't stay in this space all the time. I do need to break away from the thought patterns that I'm being said and break free and they do uh, think about stepping away from the influence that their own parents might have given them and this is what need um, the restrictions and the guidelines for things that are being taken so we need to start thinking for ourselves in relation to what we can actually do and um, moving forward Now, I had a lovely case of uh, aqua amniota where um, there was this lady that needed forward in her life. She had, if you like, disconnected from people around them, like everyone in her during isolation. And she was in her home and she felt like that she needed to move forward. And she wouldn't have been spending as much time with people and family and wouldn't have been going to the gym to know that she had to go down. So in doing that, she planned then that she wanted to go for walks and keep herself busy. Um, so one of the lovely confirming symptoms that she had said to me was when she was out walking, she had this thought that it was like she was in a bubble, that she wanted to kick out of the bubble and be free. And she had also expressed a love for swimming. She was absolutely loved swimming. One of the lovely confirming symptoms of this case is that not only do they love underwater swimming, but they have a sensation that they can breathe underwater. It's a, a very unusual sensation um, or a, a delusion, if you like, that they have. But it's in order to get ready for the outside world, and if you like, it's like the breaking of the water that pushes them along to the next phase. So. In amniotic fluid, we see the grief of the letting go of what has been in the past. And it can be for a way of living, a way of life. It can be for um, different people that have been in their life that have gone, or different belief systems. 
and so uh, you have to gather the information then and see you know all dependent how and where and we're going to move forward and it's, it's a lot for people that are afraid to make that step out that first step out of the home to transition to the outside world again and um, i was in the supermarket this morning with my children just they wanted to pick up a few things to bake as everyone is at the moment um, and it me back how strange it is being outside in the outside world now compared to what it was because you go out and everything is very sterile and um, people are not they're afraid to even look at each other you I, again as Dr. Ruchin, Ruchin has said um, everything is sterilized sterilizing your hands sterilization of everything and when you think about the aqua amniota, the amniotic fluid, is a sterile environment. This is what keeps uh, the sterility within the placenta. Uh, so it's a very important uh, remedy at this time to consider. Um, so the next remedy in this transitionary period is the umbilical cord or umbilicus humanus. Um, so if you like to come back in your home, have been nourished with the um variable and um, fed information all the time but wanting to break free from it and gather our own information and just taking that small step outside to see what it's like outside and now we come to the period where we must break that relationship to the toxicity of the past. So these are uh, that can help in the transition period from, if you like, isolation and cocooning, especially for older people, back out into the world, back out into the environment. And in Ireland, this is the stage where we're at at the moment, as there's a lot of people actually terrified still to come out of their home and to go forward. So what we need to look at here is um, with the umbilical cord that you can see here going through the fetus to the placenta. So this is the feeding tube, this is where we get fed our information. And we're taking on other people's beliefs and by doing, by being fed their beliefs, uh, we're dependent on those people as well. Now there comes a stage when each government is going to have to say to everyone, you're going to have to make your own decisions. You're going to have to um, come up with your own plan and just take control of your own health. And that's what we're trying to promote with people as well. So in giving um, umbilical cord or umbilicus humana, what we are doing is we are cutting the toxic relationships, whether it's with people or with food. It can be um, good to use for addictions, although I haven't used it myself specifically for that. But it can be one to consider for that. But um, I had uh, a lovely case where uh, there was a lady that was in a toxic relationship and of course I couldn't say it to her but what she had told me was uh, there was just um, a lot of trauma in the relationship that it wasn't good for her own mental health. So I, she was ready to make the next step forward but she felt that her partner was not ready to make it and was holding her back but she couldn't specifically see that so in giving her umbilical cord or umbilicus humana um, she was able to actually really clarify and clearly see that that relationship she wanted and it allowed her to actually break free of those stagnant energy or the stagnant feed that she was being given and it actually allowed her to actually connect with her life goals. So again, that's the link with the pandemic that you're cocooning and you're safe in the bed and you're being you're listening to instructions from uh, your authorities or whoever is giving you those authorities, even the people outside the supermarkets are giving you instructions. And you're taking in all those instructions. Now when these instructions stop being given, you're suddenly disconnected from those who have been feeding you the information and you must start to spend for yourself um, and this is a beautiful remedy to help you cut those ties 
with your authority, with your previous work relationships, even with your home and your family life bonds and any toxic relationships or infection. And it, it is just really, really good for people that have been in toxic environments or toxic situations to be able to literally put those time back into this and move on in a really positive way without actually holding on to any negativity or any anger. And the next uh, remedy in the series of transitionary remedies is vernix tapiosa. And we all know that uh, when a baby is born, that they have a layer of uh, skin, an extra layer of skin called vernix, which brings extra protection. And this is a beautiful remedy to use at the end of the transition period when a person is just ready to go out into the world. But what it does is it helps them to really stand in them, their own power and be themselves so that they can be outside in the world but as themselves. And it, it's a beautiful transitionary uh, phase where at the end of it, they can let go of any anger or hostility or um, just really um, awful um, anxiety or um, passion. They would have to whether it's relationships or work, uh, work environment or anything like that in the past. And where they can stand into themselves and really be themselves and have no fear anymore and go outside and connect with the outside world and feel that they are powerful, powerful enough so that they can go out and stand up for their own beliefs as well. Through this time of COVID-19, well, there has been a lot of talk of, um, you know, new um, prophylaxis, if you like, in um, the allopathic world to prevent the spread of it, just like we would for um, a flu prophylaxis in allopathic forms. So we find that a lot of people now are starting to question the allopathic forms and they're starting to actually uh, gather their own information on these different areas. And in doing so, when they have gone through this transitionary period, and if they need these remedies, then at the end of it, with Bernice Carpiosa, this is going to help them to actually stand up and say, well, my belief is different to yours, but I respect your belief. And by doing that, we actually take the anger, the hatred and the fear out of the discussion that we might have to have with people and that we can fully interact with ourselves, as ourselves, I should say. So that there's no pretending about who we are, there's no hiding from who we are, and there's no dependency on other people to feed us to feed us our information, to feed us our beliefs. And doing that, we must think of our family beliefs as well, and our family background, and what we have learned from our families and their beliefs. And over time, we can see that we can step into our own beliefs by gathering our information and be nice and solid in what we believe, and again, be respectful of what um, someone else believes. And it allows us to feel safe and secure in those things and in those beliefs. Now I had um, I have a picture of children here, and this is an important remedy as well. And these are all important remedies and for in transitionary periods when you think of children that are returning back to school. So children have been plucked out of school and brought home and been told that they must stay at home and they can't see their friends. So when they go back to school, it's going to be a totally new regime again. It's going to be like they're coming from the room outside and having a new experience. It's going to be like their first day back at school again. They don't know what to expect. And the teachers are going to have to enforce new rules possibly when they go back to school. One of the beautiful cases I had with uh, Bernice Carpenter was 
um, a child that had a hugely traumatic experience during birth, and so did the mother. And her um, her consultation mainly uh, focused on the birth trauma that she had experienced, and now the child was terrified to go into school, so there was nothing fearful in the school. The mother couldn't explain it, she couldn't, the child couldn't explain it, but when they went to the school door, the child just clung to the mother and she didn't want to go in. So what I did was I went back to the beginning, in the placenta, and we decided to do, as I called it, like an emotional detox. And it was like a rebirthing. So we went through the different transitionary remedies. We went from placenta to aqua amniota to placenta, and then we went to burn capillosa. And we did the one to nine. And the next week, the mother brought the child into school and she put her down on the ground, and the child ran in and didn't look back. It's you of these remedies that if we're struggling to find um, the, the symptoms of the child, we can, they can't really tell us what's wrong. And if there has been a birth trauma, we can use these remedies to help them transition into themselves, into their own, into the environment where they don't feel safe without their mother. So now we have allowed them to become confident and independent in themselves. And again, to respect, have respect for others and their opinions, to voice my own opinion back to each others. And the lovely, lovely thing is the end of society. It just subsides. And there is no holding on to the tension or the trauma or the fear that has passed. And um, that the advice of the people are no longer suppressed, that they can stand up and impact what they really love and what they really want to do with their lives moving forward. So I will end. Um, Vernix allows a person to be in the world without being overtly affected by outside influence. It allows us to hold our own integrity by being respectful and easily interacting with the world. Uh, Tina Smith has done a lot of work with Bernard Cassiusa, and I know these some of these words are um, what he would have seen. Um, there is one point I want to to this uh, here at the beginning. Uh, what I do find is that in the, the people that are given Bernard, that there is a stability. If you look at the picture, it's absolutely brilliant. There's a stability and there's a clarity on the wall, if you like, in the colours. So it's black and white and it's interlinked. So we have two different opinions, but they're both respectful for each other because they both have the same width, if you like, on the wall. And that's how it is in Bernard Cassiosa, that you can see that there is uh, different opinions, but it's okay, we can, we can handle that, we can be respectful about it, and we can give our own opinion. And as well as that, if we look at the dress of the woman in it, the one thing that they do like to do having burning is to express themselves and explore themselves, like a teenager would, but in the outside world, and they may start dressing differently, they may start dressing a little bit provocatively, to actually um, just explore a change of expression. And this is a, a period of transition as well, and a period of change. And it does settle down. Um, it doesn't become any way um, detrimental to the person. Like, but it, it is a thing to note that I do find that they do express themselves for a while afterwards in outer clothing. As Bernie is an outer layer of skin, how they would like to, they like to express themselves. So you may see as well uh, just changing satin and changing um, dressing uh, on people that would use Bernie and that would uh, benefit from it as well. Uh, so these matrodonal remedies are available at CBOX Farms in the UK, England. And also the homeopathy supplies are in stock. 
And that is the end of my presentation. Thank you very much. Um, I hope you have benefited from Thomas. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Antoinette. Now, we won't do live questions with you because unfortunately the sound That's is very fine. so uh, what I'm saying to all of you is at the end of Ton Janssen's presentation you will see my email you please send any questions you have for Antoinette to me and I will check with her and we'll put the answers out um, on Facebook or on the LCH site somewhere uh, so that you can have your answers. So thank you very much indeed. And now it is time for Dr. Farouk Master's presentation, our uh, senior academician for the LCH and the RSH UK. So Dr. Farouk, are you there? Yes, sir. I'm going to put my video off and welcome to you, Dr. Farouk. So thank you all for inviting me for this lovely webinar organized by the London School of Homeopathy. Basically, I'm going to share exactly what I can mm -hmm. in my city about COVID and its post-COVID-19 care and what can happen and what is happening. So let's see. Next. So the first problem that I have witnessed, as you all know that I work in a hospital setting, we have Department of Homeopathy trying to integrate modern medicine with uh, homeopathy. But basically, people when they are admitted into the intensive care unit, the biggest and the crumblesome problem is the wearing a mask, oxygen marks around the nose, around the mouth, and or inserting a nasal cannula all these are so irritating, especially to people who have a mark fear of suffocation. And there are many other normal people also in this world where you try to put even a handkerchief around their nose or even if you put a hand around their nose or mouth and they immediately suffocate. So imagine such people when they are admitted to intensive care unit where they just can't do anything. This is the first problem I want to highlight. Next. The solution. Next. So here is the rubric which I would like to show that is very useful. In fact, Lachesis is one such rubric with this characteristic symptom and many times only on this symptom I am able to prescribe lachesis very successfully even in a constitutional case, even in an acute case, even in a chronic case and also in cases where there is a mask in the ICU and the patient is struggling with the mouse or the nasal tube. Next. And there's another rubric where handkerchief is approaching towards the mouth and causing breathlessness and the patient cannot bear to have this. If lettuces fails, my next remedy is usually ammonium carbonicum. Argentum nitricum are usually reserved for chronic cases and not much for acute cases. But my first shot with this particular symptom or modality is the cases. Next. And then you can take a general larger rubric if you want to and that is clothing around the external throat. 
Now here, it's a very interesting rubric because here you will see four snakes which are very characteristic. Sankaris, Crotellus cascavela, Crotellus horridus and Lachesis. And then in a small marks, you will see a fifth snake, what is known as Naja. Now this is a typical snake symptom that any clothing around the external throat and even also see the another snake elapse. So you will see most of the snake remedy are dumped into this mm -hmm. particular rick. But again, I will tell you that legacy is, is the number one. Sankaris, I have not much use with this kind of uh, symptom. But another remedy which I have used a lot is Crotellus horridus. So again, you will see that all this combination of rubrics will keep on bringing up serpent remedies. Next. Problem number two. The biggest problem is the nightmares. People who are in ICU and who are seriously ill, when they close their eyes, suffer from nightmares, this is a known fact. And they get very scared when you wake them up. They can become frenzied. They can develop sweating, a sense of doom. They feel like they are seeing some spiders or some viruses crawling on their body. And they see their friends and family dying. This is a very important psychological trauma of some people who are admitted in intensive coronary care unit. Next, what's the solution? Nightmares falling asleep on. Now here, the most important remedy that comes to my rescue is ammonium carb. Now you already saw in the previous problem number one that ammonium carb hates the oxygen mask and the tubings in the nose, tubing from the mouth, and then this nightmare. So combination of these two is ammonium carb. But suppose there is not many symptoms related to mask or suffocation, then for the nightmares, the most useful remedy in my practice is cannabis indica. Cannabis indica. Next. And see spider, if somebody says specific of spiders, then it is like caninum. Next. Also agaricus with almost similar meaning. You can look under delusion. Next. Problem number three on ventilator. And people who are hospitalized in ICU and then they are put on ventilator. The most important thing is that they are prone to develop pneumonia. That's for very important. But people who are on ventilator cannot sometimes be weaned off. And the ventilator keeps on going on for days and days and days together. And the longer the person is on ventilator, more the complications will come. So all complications related to mechanical ventilator or when you are trying to taper the ventilator because you can't keep the person for a very long time. What are the problems and what are the solutions? Next. So you can develop severe emphysema. That's very, very important. You can develop infections and develop respiratory distress syndrome. Next. Now these are the group of remedies that I use a lot in my practice when I have to wean off ventilator. Some are common remedies like carbovage, loreceresus and lobelia. But some are little rare remedies like mustard gas, 
hydrocyanic acid, lobelia purpura, solanin, and solaninum aceticum. Solaninum aceticum is, was mentioned for the very first time in homeopathic literature by late Dr. Margaret Lucy Tyler. Next. So you can look under this rubric, which is given in the repertory under chest, paralysis, paralysis of the lung, equivalent to acute respiratory distress syndrome. The repertory that I'm referring right now is a synthesis repertory. Next. The fourth problem that many times people fight with the ventilator because they want to take their own breaths and the ventilator is also giving them the own breaths. And that is why many times the doctors give sedative to the patients so that they are relaxed and they don't fight with the ventilator. Or sometimes people try to pull out the catheter, pull out the tube, especially when they become delirious. This is another problem that I see in intensive care. Next. So here, look to this rubric. This is what I refer. Foreign body sensation in the nose. So when you put a tube in the nose, this is the rubric that I refer in the hospital. Foreign body sensation in the nose. Next. Irritation in the nose. Next. Foreign body sensation in the throat. Next. Bread crumb sensation in the throat. Crumb sensation in the larynx. Next. Irritation in the throat. Again, when you repertorize all these rubrics which I just mentioned, lachesis will come up very high. Remember that. Next. Lump sensation in the throat. Next. Problem number five. People who are on intubations for a very long time, after they have been transferred to the normal room, they suffer from weakness in general, loss of memory, anxiety, depression, hallucination, and difficulty in sleeping, walking, and talking. Now, this period can remain for a one week, 15 days, three weeks, or even a month. Next. So this is a rubric I usually refer, weakness that remains after acute illnesses. That's the first rubric. Second rubric is weakness of memory, sudden and periodical, which I refer to. Third. Next. Next, anxiety about health. Next, mind sadness about disease. This is a very small rubric, but very useful. Difficult respiration while talking. Here is the remedy, stanum, you know, when, when, when you talk with the person and ask him, what is your name? And the person says, 
I am it. So and so. When a person talks like this, this clearly indicates weakness in the chest and the symptom of characteristic symptom of stenum metallicum. Next. Next. Difficult respiration while walking. Next. Problem number six. About one foot of the patient will be having difficulty in sitting position after being admitted in intensive care unit. Next. The solutions. So here you can look under respiration, difficult sitting, and again, lachesis, loriceresis are the prominent remedies that will come up. Next. About one third of the patient who enter the ICU will later on suffer from PTSD, post-traumatic syndrome. Next. We have a lovely rubric in our repertory, post-traumatic stress disorder or post-traumatic syndrome, wherein you will see remedies like plumbum and opium are very, very important in my practice. This is followed by conayam and aurum mur natronatum. These are some of the very leading remedies that I use for post-traumatic stress disorder. Some mm -hmm. find order the traumatic mm -hmm. brain injury. Next. So you can look on the head injuries after head. This is the rubric that I refer. Because we don't have exactly all the rubrics in the repertory. But we have to sometimes see a better solution in the repertory. Next. The ninth problem. The ninth problem will be something that people suffer for months together. Rehabilitation in unfamiliar facilities. Mask, stranger, mask strangers unable to receive friends or loved ones because of the prolonged separation from the family, because they were admitted in the hospitals. Many spouses and children will become caregivers, which comes with its own emotional and physical challenges. Roughly two-thirds of family caregivers show depressive symptoms after loved ones stay in the ICU. So see here, it's not only the patient who is admitted in the hospital who suffers, but also the relatives who miss their loved ones and were, you know, the patients were in ICU and they were constantly exposed to hospital people, constantly saw nurses and doctors wearing a mask, wearing a gown, and all those depressive symptoms will come in a very, very big way. I have been working in hospital for more than 30 years now and I see this problem on a regular basis. Solution. So you will see company desire for. Because when somebody is in the hospital, the patient always wants somebody from the house, somebody close to him to be near him. So give the company. Here you should think of a remedy, phosphorus and kalika, which are very, very prominent. Next. Four-second feeling because nobody is around them. Sacrum officinalis is a lovely remedy for four-second feeling for the people who are admitted in the hospital. Next. So this was my first presentation. Now we go to the next presentation and that is hope.
I have three presentations today for you. So you saw that how people are admitted in the intensive care unit in the hospital because we have today no place or a no bed available in the hospital in India. All the beds in the leading hospitals are full with corona patients. So I'm sharing you with you the first hand information that I have seen. So now let us talk about the hope in the times of Corona. That's the title of my presentation. Next. Let's have some look at the statistical data to begin with. Yes, next. So the number of deaths in Europe, Southeast Asia and India in the last two months of 2020, 41,687 deaths due to coronavirus, 69,602 with common cold and influenza, 1,40,584 people died of malaria, 1,53,696 people committed suicide. Next. One lakh ninety three thousand four hundred and seventy nine people died of road accidents. Two lakh forty people, nine hundred and fifty people died of HIV loss. Three lakhs fifty eight thousand four hundred and seventy one died of alcohol consumption. Seven lakh sixteen thousand four hundred and ninety four died of smoking. And 11 lakh of people died of cancer. Yet, we are afraid of corona and corona phobia. Why? Then do you really think corona is a very dangerous disease as it is projected? It is, is the purpose of media campaign to settle the trade between China and America? Next or to reduce financial markets to prepare the stage of financial mergers and acquisitions or to sell US treasury bonds to cover the fiscal defect in them. Next. Is it a panic created by pharma companies to sell their products like sanitizers, masks, medicine, etc. in India? All these pharmacies their price in the share markets in the last two months have gone skyrocket and they are minting money in lakhs and lakhs of rupees by selling all these products only because of the fear or corona phobia. Next. And don't kill yourself with unnecessary fear. Next. Three lakh thirty-eight thousand seven hundred and twenty-four people are sick with coronavirus at the moment, of which eighty-one thousand and ninety-three are in China. With a population of over one point one billion, this means that if you are not in or haven't recently visited China, this should eliminate ninety-four percent of your concern. Next. If you do not contact virus, this still is not a cause for panic. Eliminate your anxiety. Next. Eighty-one percent of the cases of corona that we see in Bombay, India, are mild. 
14 percent of the cases are moderate and only five percent are critical which means that even if you do get the virus you are most likely to recover from it next some have said but this is worse than sars sars had a fatality rate of 10 percent while covid 19 has a rate fatality rate of only two percent next moreover looking at the ages of those who are dying with this virus the death rate for the people under 50 years of age is only 0.2 percent that rate depends on age group mm -hmm. you can look over here on this graph 80 plus 70 79 60 69 as you go higher if you see it before 30 years hardly any next This means that if you are under 50 years of age and don't live in China, you are more likely to win the lottery, which has one in four, five, triple zero, triple zero chance. Next. Italy records its highest debt daily debt toll. Sunday, 22nd March in Italy, 793 people died. That's the thing which I got from BBC. Next. Next. Let us take one of the worst days so far. The 10th of February, 108 people in China died of coronavirus. Exactly on the same day when Italy had so many deaths, when China had so many deaths, let us see on the same day what else happened. Next. Twenty six thousand two hundred eighty three people died of cancer. Twenty four thousand six hundred forty one people died of heart disease. Four thousand three hundred people died of diabetes. Suicide took twenty eight times more lives than the virus did. Next. Mosquito killed 2,740 people every day. Humans kill 1,300 fellow humans every day. Snakes kill 137 people every day. And sharks kill two people in a year. Next. So what do you do? Next. Take multivitamins and do the daily things to support your immune system. Wear a face mask, wash your hands, do not touch your eyes, eyes with dirty hands, use tissue when you cough, when you sneeze. Well, this is what you should do. And if you still want to protect yourself, use some natural things. Salt water gargling is very important. Turmeric with milk is very good drink, a hot milk. Having Tulsi tea. Tulsi tea is very, very useful. Or chewing two few leaves of Tulsi early in the morning is very healthy. It will build up your immune system. We have got an Indian herb known as Justitia Adatoda. It's there also in our Materia Medica in drugs of Hindustan. There are, there are papers on PubMed where it improves the immunity against the upper and lower respiratory tract. So do all those natural things. That will help to prevent the coronavirus. Simple things. Next. 
next and do not live in fear next because mental health is just as important as physical health next and now i go to my final presentation amongst all the remedy that are mentioned in materia medica i feel sorinum fits a lot with this kind of post covid situation in a lockdown for almost now 3 months in uh, india so the type of emotional impact the emotional impact of fear and anxiety of covid on one hand and then staying in the house another hand and conflicts of all these emotions reminds me of a remedy sorinum or nosod it's a very big remedy i don't know how much i i can talk today but i will just give you a brief idea next so as you all know that this remedy was introduced by dr herring when he was in suriname and a, a negro came to him with some eruptions pussy eruptions on the palms and uh, herring took that pus and uh, collected it in a vial with alcohol and brewed the remedy many authors have wrongly mentioned that it is made from the scabies i don't think so because it is not mentioned by then in fact herring was very doubtful that whether it was scabies so and it was not brewed in by any microscope so please be very careful homeopaths are using this terminology scabies potentize and scabies eruption potentize i think so it is wrong it has nothing to do with scabies the preparation that herring made in the year 1830 next so state of mind of sorinum versus the mind of covid 19 person next i will go little fast because time is short so you will see hypochondriac very important part of sorinum anxiety about one own health future fear now economy is very bad the economical health in india is very bad unfortunately there is no balance between an economical health and the physical health i think so there has to be some balance and that's what dr rukshin master also said today in the in her presentation about arsenic which also has which also shares many symptoms which i just mentioned but here in sorinum you have a fright people are so much afraid to come down i i know some people who have not come out of their house even for few seconds they want to be locked in their room and not and they refuse to meet any other person next anxiety about future they don't want to spend money what if sometimes the economy will go bad debt lot of things to do with debt i will die i am surely going to die doomed fail everything we and he was going to lose all the fortune so all this kind of insecurity that you see in sorinum i see this on a regular basis every day basis next so delusion being sick so many people go for covid test with just fever there's a long queues in the laboratories despair for cure despair about future despair for recovery and fear of contagion now this is very important next you can see how many bottles of sanitizers are used in a family they touch somebody they immediately put sanitization 
whatever they buy, they put sanitizers on top of it. I don't know. This is a phobia. Fear something will happen. Misfortune. Losing money. Fear of poverty. Next. Sadness. Losing money. Suicidal dispositions. Washing desire to wash. Next. So, these were some rubrics which came to my mind. But basically, most important is a feeling of helplessness. Many patients that I see during this pandemic have this fear that this lockdown will remain for a very long time. And how am I going to pass my days? A lot of frustration comes in him and he feels he's stuck in one particular place and he cannot move there's a lot of lot of despair he has a strong feeling of danger from outside and the fear comes out of a situation in which he finds himself when he has not really assessed the risk involved so this despair and helplessness becomes one of a very important uh, characteristic of the remedy sorinum. Next, let's go to the next part. Despair of recovery during convalescence. That's a very, very important rubric because we are talking today of post-COVID, which means that there is a danger right up to the last step. He has suffered from such a dangerous illness that he cannot afford to have even the slightest hope. So he has despair until he recovers totally. Next. Next. The value of one owns life. Sorinum feels that regenerative abilities are poor. He is unable to recuperate, to really become well. Life seems fragile to him and his own possibilities for doing something about it seems inadequate. As a result, his life degenerates. He feels as though he was he were rotting and sinking into the filth. Also, mentally, he has the feeling of not being well enough equipped for life. He is unable to get a handle on his problem. Things are too complicated and he feels no joy. This exactly even happened during the very large epidemic of plague in Europe. Same feelings. Next. Next. Where is the slides? I can't see the slide. So the next part, which I would like to discuss is man's part. His life leads him to his goal on a spiritual level through the acquisition of knowledge, on the soul level through joy and the level of doingness through action expressing his value. These qualities of human life are disdain here. So practically there is no joy, especially life's physical
just keep it the way it was previously don't try to change Now please don't change your trick. So, I was over here telling you that there is no joy. Especially life physical side is rejected. As it does not constitute a condition of tranquility and sobriety. But on the contrary, in its regeneration and maintenance is always subject to what's happening. Is everything okay? I think there is a net problem. He is, his net is not working. Who's? Mine? Mine? Your reaction. Oh. Yatri. Can I try mine? Okay. So Surainam does not want to be active, to think, to work in order to fulfill his life. Also the joy and the dignity of human life seem to be too paltry to him. He makes claim to self-determined perfect life in which his regeneration maintenance does not depend on God's grace. Next slide. Sorainam inner attention revolves around the theme, lack of vitality, lack of regenerative ability, lack of vital force, filth, putrefaction, fragility of life, the lack of ability to react to life's demand. And to achieve thing, he does not have a spotless, pure body and soul. Next, he is unable to come up to scratch as regard to life challenges. He does not understand anything. He is unable to get an overview of his own affairs. The world is too complicated for him. He behaves wrongly. He has lost confidence in his own abilities. Life seems not worth living, there is no joy, his emotion seems dead, and it is as if he himself were dead. He feels unclean, his body feels dirty and rotten. Next. Fear of failure and illness. The future seems to be of defeat, bankruptcy, lack of faith in salvation. Next, Elton Royces, he makes sure that others feel soiled and ill. He is a very big pessimist and he spreads pessimism. He backbites others and stains their honor. Inconsolable. You are always alone. There is no divine protection. A very nihilistic type of person. Next, despair, hopelessness, pessimism, born loser. Helplessly under the sway of ups and downs of life. Now one particular proof testifies four times of the optimism he felt. Cheerful, lively, enjoys everything and the pictures, the future in the biggest color. Once of an alteration between liveliness and 
depression and five times of melancholy and despairing mood so it was more melancholy and despairing than cheerfulness now this is mentioned in uh, allen's encyclopedia when the prover was given the 28th potency and melancholy and despairing came in a very big way next tremendous anxiety next lack of love money will power hope knowledge ambition reaction healing power and life impulses confusion to his identity now this is very very important part of sorainam he had no body head separated from the body body parts are divided arms separated from the body and body parts are absent next now this is nothing but delusional misidentification syndrome in psychology or what we call as cotard delusion or what we also call as reduplicative paramnesia sorainam is full of all this next great unwashable like sulfur sulfur feels great unwash and sorainam is great unwashable very close to each other who desire to wash his hands always washing the hands that is the rubric and desire to wash in general next dreams are almost similar excrements next interpretation now when you see this dreams of excrements this is what you will see you have a guilty conscious or you feel that you are in fact a dirty person dreams of having a poop you may find yourself in a situation that is either disgusting or filthy and you cannot find a way out to poop in public in your dream indicates the ancient dream lore that you are feeling exposed and vulnerable open to new possibilities and removing negativity emptying bowels as a symbol of getting rid of negative thoughts feces shit in dreams can be a symbol of getting rid of something that has been a burden to us psychologically next the psychology of hand washing patients with compulsive hand washing perform excessive and repetitive washing of the hands in an attempt to relieve severe distress associated with obsessive and irrational fear of contamination compulsive hand washing is often a debilitating psychodermatological condition interfering with the patient's activities of daily living and quality of life let's take an example of the monk i think so most of you have seen the television series uh, of a monk do you remember a gentle detective adrian monk works the grimy streets of san francisco but is so driven by the fear of germs that he must scrub his hand after shaking hand with someone monk is also called the poster boy for obsessive compulsive disorders in fact in an informal survey conducted by obsessive compulsive foundation ocd patient said they like the character who triumph even when his condition interferes with his ability to do work monk is a germaphobe the popular name for the people who became obsessed with germs and dirt and feel compelled to act out rituals of washing and cleaning real people with this condition include the late howard hughes and saddam hussein who reportedly often ordered visitor to strip and wash with antibacterial soap before meeting him delusion of parasitosis delusion of parasitosis or dop is known as delusional infestations acrophobia ichbom syndrome morgellons is classified as a primary psychiatric disorder the pathology of primary psychiatric disorder including dop have a fixed false belief that they are infested with parasites or other organism 
And this is right now happening with COVID pandemic. You will see thousands of people with this kind of phobia. Next. Some physical generals. Basically, what I see is the suppressed eruption, which can bring this kind of state, mental, emotional state that I have just described to you. Yes. Profuse perspiration and debility after acute illness is a very important thing that I observe in this remedy. Next. Very chilly patients. Next. Frequent colds. Change of weather. Constant hunger, waking from the sleep, from hunger. Worse when hungry. Headaches preceded or attended by canine hunger and better by eating. Worse cold and heat. Remember, even though it's a chilly remedy, it is also worse by heat. Worse summer, worse exposure to sun. Approach of storm, especially thunderstorm aggravates. Foul discharges of stool, sweat, foot sweat, odor of the body, otoria. I think so. You should read a very nice case of Margaret Tyler who describes about Sorinum, where she was treating a lady who had tuberculosis and there was an offensive odor from the mouth. It was so offensive that she had to run away from that lady because it was highly offensive and she gives Sorinum to the patient and the odor disappears. And she says, according to her experience with homeopathy, Sorianum has the most offensive odor of rotten eggs. Even she says worse than a rotten egg. And that is Sorianum. So please read the case of Margaret Tyler. Next. Sensitive to draft wants head to be covered even in summer. Acne from fats, sugar, coffee, meat. Worse during menses. Craves alcohol, charcoal, beer, but most important things that he craves is sour, sweets, and beer. These are the three things that I see in my patients. Next, <clears throat> aversion to pork, tomatoes, and warm food. Next, lot of aggravations in Sorinum, but honey. Milk, fruit, and coffee stand out very strong. Peculiar confirmatory symptoms. The most important uh, peculiar confirmatory symptom that I know in Sorinum is that when they see the dream in the night, it carries on all the way to the next day. That's a very peculiar symptom that I usually uh, see in uh, Sorinum patients. And uh, another very characteristic thing that I many times uh, see in the Sorinum patient is the, the perspiration on palms of hands at night. Very characteristic. And the asthma better by lying on the back. Even the angina, which is uh, better uh, lying on the back, feels unusually well before they are going to uh, get an attack of illness. Coriza is also better by lying like mercury. Mercury is, I think, so a very important remedy when coriza is better by lying. And uh, another very important thing that is... Uh, that when in the vision, they see trembling of objects. So trembling of objects, you will see, you know, in the vision chapter, the rubric, and black spots before the headache or blue stars before the headache. These are some of the 
peculiar symptom that I usually see in my uh, practice for solanum. I think so I should end my presentation. I have honestly given you what I have seen in the hospital, its interpretation and the picture resembling the remedy solanum. Thank you so much. If you have questions, please ask me. We hardly have time for questions because we're uh, running out of time. Um, one person only, Dr. Farouk says, can you repeat last few symptoms where you talked of your experience? Well, uh, Gita, um, uh, Dr. Farouk, are you going to make these slides available afterwards? Yes, yes. Right. Okay, everyone, the slides will be available, so this will repeat anything uh, that you missed. I'm looking to see if any other questions come through, otherwise we ought to move on. Yes, somebody, yes, you'll, you'll get the slides, Christina. Yeah. Okay, Dr. Farouk, thank you for being so complete and really giving us an insight and thank you for putting this thing that our next speaker, Ton Janssen, calls the hysteria virus into perspective. Thank you very much. So now we come to our next speaker who is uh, Ton Janssen and he is in the Netherlands. Ton, are you there? Yeah, I'm there. And we just, yes, good, your face is there. Right. So, uh, Tom, uh, Dr. Sandeep or Dr. Sarab is going to show your slides. You just please say next whenever you uh, want yes. to move on. So, I'm going to shut myself down no, and over no, to no, you. No, you don't. You don't. You do the introduction, you said. <laughs> I think that's introduced all right, hasn't it? So, I'm on the screen, no? Uh, I can yes, you are on the screen. I can see your screen. You are there on the screen. Okay. No, I can, I can see you. We can see you, Ton. We can see your screen share. Yeah. Okay. So... I need to have my PowerPoint. Each time you say next, Tom, they will move the screen for us. Ton, your microphone seems to have gone on to mute. That's better. Is that better? You can hear me? We can hear you now. Thank you. Okay. So, um, good afternoon, everybody, or evening. Um, we're going to talk about the hysteria because it is a hysteria virus. So because of the hysteria, people come in a bigger problem than normal viruses. Uh, because of the whole theater around this disease. So I have uh, beautiful cases to explain how, to I, how I solve them. So a female from 59 years old. No, a female from... 20, uh, 42 years old, a nurse. I treated her years before. Uh, for a very bad asthma. And she 
was cured and I saw already 20 years not in my practice anymore. So for many years, she did well on homeopathy. Uh, and now she come with, uh, uh, tested with COVID-19 and a lot of uh, symptoms she had, like choking, difficult breathing, unable to breathe out properly and be not able to, to work. And that was for her a big issue because she liked the work and she wanted to serve. She was a, a server in, in general, you can, could say. So a lot of salav salavia, dry uh, lyrics, uh, with short breath, and she was giving uh, salbutamol and prednisone to the general practitioner, but it cover it, it were not a beautiful result. She get only a little relief of it, but when they stop prednisone, everything comes back. The next slide, please. So she was in a very bad mood. She was very suppressed. She, she hugged to, to air and I give her sulfur, antimonium sulfur, RAM, 10M. The mood improved very quickly. Respiration, respiration. in two hours she was calm uh, breathing also the uh, rattling of lungs are better so she was much better less anxiousness and she had dreaming about choking so she get so she, she um, was very bad after very, uh, she become very much better after antimonium sulfuratum auratum. But after Baptiza, who has this dream about choking and also the other symptoms, 200, one granula every uh, day one, three days after each other, and she was complete cured and she wanted to go to the work uh, again. She was a nurse in a uh, revalidation uh, nurse. So she got a lot of, she treated already a lot of uh, uh, corona patients with breathing problems. And she uh, go again to the work, but she need to, she want to go directly after these three days, but she need to wake to wait for um, one week and then she was allowed to go. So she was very happy. The next, yes. So the anxiety, uh, stone on the chest, uh, sensation on the, arm and legs would break that that would break stunham was giving one granula three days everything goes better i forgot this because i worked never with such a slide so but after the stunham she was completely back as normal so you see what you can do if you follow the, the steps and you every time you uh, have a review of what happens and what is better step by step. And you see, mostly there is no one remedy. That's what I want to explain with this case. Next slide, please. A male, 42 years old. Obesitas in the so he was much too too obese. 
whole life bron bronchitis, a lots of antibiotics, the symptoms, great panic, really great panic, not only because of the uh, corona, but also on other things. It was it very easily in panic? So lots of mucus in his lungs, greenish, brownish, sticky, coughing, calium bichromicum, 200 he gets. But it giving him not so big relief. So feeling of coughing despaired when Koch, Koch feeling like his lungs were unable to take up more oxygen, saturation, 84%, short breath, I give him Aspidosperma 200. Three days, one granula. Next slide, please. She was still several times in his life, but doing well for many years. Symptoms. Fear the world will fall in chaos. That's for a lot of people now on the moment. Some people say, and I believe it is the case, we are in the third world war. Fear of government will ruin everything. Don't want to live in this world. They can't understand people behave like they do now. So the lockdown has despaired him, feeling trapped. So respiration difficulty because of fear, difficult breaths, fear of the devil. So I have done things wrong. So he tests negative on COVID-19. Next slide, please. I give Aura Metallicum, 10M, singly dose. No, no longer, no interest anymore in news about COVID-19. So he's, he split himself off from news. Going to cycle and enjoy nature. Get ideas how to get on with his business. Now more difficult respiration. No more, no more longer angus. His wife said it's a miracle. Miracle has happened. So. Sometimes we need to see only what is the real clue about this case. So this is a beautiful expression of it. Next slide, please. A female, 48 years old, a nurse. So she was treated in the, in the past with for endometriosis with great success, homeopathically. And now she has symptoms, very cold, pneumonia, despite antibiotics, chill and breathlessness, pain lower back when coughing, tested positive on COVID-19. She gets sepia 10M, a single dose. After three days, she was improved and she could work again. So I show this case to a, a few of my nearest colleagues and they say, this is not about sepia. But if you read sepia, it is a, it's a very important remedy, remedy for pneumonia. And also uh, uh, lower pain in the back when they cough. So, and she was a uh, uh, she was a career type, um, more manly like lady. She was not a really a lady. She was business like doing business like a man. So, 
it was a beautiful remedy with great success. So next slide, please. So if you see the repertorization, you see Sapia on the fifth place. Next slide, please. A female, 51 years old, medium care nurse, nurse. So you see, I have a lot of nurses because they work with uh, uh, COVID-19 patients. So she had thyroid problems, Hashimoto disease symptoms, bron bronchiopneumonia and pneumonia treat with lots of antibiotics. Dry cough, restlessness, need of fresh air, burning head and chest, hornets of barely and able, barely able to speak, extremely uh, action, fear of death. So she was really extremely fear of death. And she was always running, always doing, very restless. So for me, clear symptoms for Arsenic amiodatum, 10M, three days, one granula. So the DD of Arsenicum album, all complaints improved, not so listless anymore. And the Hashimoto was much better. Next slide, please. So if you see the repertorization, you see Yodatum and Asenicum very on the front. So that for me, I see of the, the combination is there as a homeopathic remedy and it is there. So this is a beautiful choice and you saw it was a really great uh, progress and healing process. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. A female. 74 years old, a nurse, a patient with several allergies to antibiotics, food, additives, gluten, a lot of uh, uh, allergies, tested positive on COVID-19, the symptoms, severe breastlessness, really severe, she couldn't she was scrapping the air, lots of cough and mucus. So uh, being uh, trained of prednisolone, shock in her body, spastic drinks with her arm after prednisolone. Overstimulated by prednisone. So she gets Camphora bromatum, 1M, a single dose. After 10 minutes, the shock and the spastic swings, twistings di disappeared. After a course of prednisone, was giving uh, in, a, in a, a course four to four, four doses of each, uh, 30 to 100 m and 10 m over eight weeks next slide please so we see on this uh, uh, repertorization that come is in the front 
And it is Camphora bromatum is not a well known case, but bromatum has very beautiful uh, suffocated uh, uh, and lung problems and a lot of tremors. And Camphora has also tremors and is in an, on an other way suffocated. So it is a beautiful remedy, Camphora bromatum, to, to get an, after an allergic reaction um, with a lot of tremors and twisting of legs and even with unconsciousness and this kind of movements. It's a beautiful remedy. So this nurse is again healthy. Next uh, page. So you can read this. So even Camphora bromatum help her for uh, the problems with her limbs and uh, as the COVID symptoms and also Parkinson symptoms. So this beautiful remedy. Next slide, please. Male of 68 years old. A new patient with high blood pressure, diabetes type 2, obesitas and COPD tested positive on COVID-19. His wife visit me as her husband is in the hospital on a ventilator. His kidneys has stopped to work. Grey discoloration on his skin, depressed, Deserved restlessness, dry cough. And I, th I have given years ago to a patient uh, with, uh, high, uh, with kidney failure. So I give ichthyolum 500k in a dilution every hour when he is awake shaking three times. After three doses, he improved. His blood values calmed, calmed. And breathing after one and a half day, he was much better. Then over a week, uh, in the morning and evening, ECO is 500k. And um, Sina Sulfuricum 200, three times on the day, a granula for exhaustion. Next slide, please. Ichthyolum comments. You can hardly find it in your repertorium. So also the gray skin, kidney failure were there. So it was the moment to give this remedy. And you react very well on it. So maybe this is not, this is a good remedy to remember with kidney failure after a, a sepsis would be also a beautiful remedy. Next slide. slide. So how to prescribe less unknown remedies? They often do not show up in the main repertories. So I can only recommend what you do with the study of Materia Medica reading a few remedy, remedies or remedy families every day that helps you to become familiar with the symptoms. 
or recognize the significant indicators from the remedies from the patients you really need. So you can also find a MacRap if you look where it is, where your symptom, where you can find a symptom who you want to have uh, remedies with uh, in the in the Materia Medica, and then you find the uh, special remedies who are not coming up in the repertorization. That's what I do often. Next slide, please. So you can read it, this is very clear, so. There is a beautiful new remedy and it's COVID-19 uh, nosote. Fear of phobia. Dirt, syphilitic miasm, but I saw also that it is a uh, storic miasm. So, what the people do now on days is is that they, that people are very low uh, abiding. That's a very important symptom for COVID nineteen. So they obey the lockdown. That's are the people who say when you are shorter to each other than one and a half meter, please go out of each other, one and a half meter. That's the new law. So. Next slide. So you see, you can send all the questions, if they are, to Roger. He will manage it because I'm very busy to write my new book about human chemistry with lots of new remedies. And my very busy practice or clinic. So Roger will do this for me. So thank you, thank you all. If there are questions, please, you can ask. Okay, does anyone have any urgent question for Ton? Because again, the slides will be available to you afterwards. I'll look and see if any come in here on the Q and A. Uh, Oh, one person, Ton, says, why did you give high potencies in many of these cases? They're probably thinking instead of 6 or 12 or 30, you were giving 200 and M and 10 M. Yes, but I'm pretty sure about the remedy. I, I like to give a high potential because when it do nothing, uh, then I'm missing the goal of the, 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 the disease or the, the symptoms. Do you understand what I'm saying? So if you give a low potential, it do always something. Do you understand? In my point of view and my experience, when I give a, a C30 uh, in an uh, acute case, or in a chronic situation, uh, I do something, but it takes some time to give a big uh, um, relief of the problems. Mm. If you give hypotension, then 
you have directly a, a reaction, an admiration, very quick. Within uh, 10 or in one hour, you see already some result. That's by experience. But when you give a high potential and you are an, not pointed to the problem, then it do nothing. So then uh, there is a need to search again to the best re remedies who is available. Is that an answer? Uh, yes, thank you, John. Um, in giving the quercetin and zinc uh, uh, as supplements, what dosage, in any particular dosage somebody's asking? Or just what it says on the bottle? <laughs> uh, three times what is said on the bottle. Three times what it says. Yeah, and zinc, uh, 100 milligram. Right, so quercetin three times the stated dose and 100 milligrams of zinc. Um, Yes, and then there was something else here. And that's for the first three days. Hmm. And then you go on the uh, zinc uh, 30 mi milligrams a day and a, a one dose of uh, quercetine. Yes. And quercetine has likely the same uh, result as uh, chloroquine, hydrochloroquine, uh, 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 allopathic remedy. In that it stops the virus getting into the cell. Yes, together with zinc. And yeah. also it is given with zinc. Yeah, that's right. And then somebody says, have you used the new COVID-19 nosode uh, either for treating or prevention? And you've told me you have, so... Um, I it use it preventive for people now on days for nurses and also for anxiety people in yeah. a 200 potential uh, once a week. Yes. So those who are very much exposed and those again with this great anxiety. And somebody says, why such a frequent change of remedies? Well, you said you were following the course of the patient's recovery, right? Yes, yes, mm. right. So the changes um, were in relation to what the symptoms were presenting. These were acute conditions when the symptoms can often change. Yeah. And um, do you give homeopathic treatment along with people having allopathic medicines? Yes. Because when you are right with the remedies, that we are homeopathic remedies are stronger than allopathic remedies, allopathic medicines. Do we know how the nosode was prepared? It is taken from uh, the COVID-19 saliva isolate uh, virus. Yeah. Was it isolated from a patient? Yeah. Yeah, good. Yes. Yeah, because there was somebody asking. Yeah, well, at the moment, the remedy is hardly available. It must be admitted. Yeah. You managed to get it, but I don't think we have it in UK yet. And in India, this will have to come. It is there, but the, the, the pharmacist is not... Uh, uh, the law is against... to 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 sell it. Yes, yes. So this will have to be, have to be done in India. Yeah, I hope they, they will. Yes, yes. And it looks like very uh, closely to tuberculinum and spsorinum. Yes, as you said, and some cephalinum, good. Right, um, I think the other questions we must deal with afterwards so, Ton, thank you very much indeed. And uh, we'll let the, pic the your camera go off and then we'll ask Dr. Peter Gaidosh to come on for our last presentation of the day. Yeah.
Thank you. Ah, there's Peter. So, Ton, can you turn your camera off? Good. Peter, are you there? Yes. Yeah. Right. So, Dr. Peter Gaidosh is running a very active practice in Czechoslovakia and, as I have discovered already, is a very inventive researcher and a very dynamic presenter of his work. So, Peter, you please now, uh, you are unmuted, yes, you're ready to go. You please um, now share with us your presentation. Okay. Okay, so hello everybody, good afternoon, good evening, good morning, whenever you are across the globe. So as you know, I already had one presentation about ozonum because I prescribe this remedy since the end of January this year, quite often with very great success. And uh, today I was asked initially to do kind of differential diagnosis, what are the other potential remedies which will follow well after the ozonum or what, what are the medicine I'm using during the pandemic or after effect of pandemic. So I hope I will be able to present uh, uh, everything clearly, but I found myself quite uh, in, a, in a strange situation because I end up already with 150 slides, which is not handy for uh, 20 minutes of presentation. So I try to focus on the more, most important things and I will give you more uh, overview of it. Uh, and I'm not, I will probably not go into details of every remedy I'm going to suggest, but I will give you the overview and then and I stop with some remedies which I found, found really helpful in uh, the situation of COVID uh, or the pandemic or the global situation generally we are facing up unprecedentedly. So as you see and what Antoinette, Antoinette already suggests, there is a, a close relationship, uh, for example, with the ozone, not only with the remedies which will come naturally from the life cycle of the ozone, because it must be generated somewhere. There is, the, there is a, the whole cycle of it. And then you can find very easily a connection between other remedies, which will either follow well or complement the cure. And one of the, the remedy, which is really closely related to ozone, is uh, uh, umbilicus humanum. So I'm using this in my practice as well, and you will see during the presentation what are the main indications in my practice for umbilicus. <clears throat> so I will start probably strangely because this is the forecast. This is a it was it came to my uh, to my mailbox just let's say uh, four or five hours ago. And it's saying that uh, the Australia should be prepared for the really uh, huge storm with the torrential rain, strong winds and everything. And I hope I will be able to show you how the global situation in the world is reflected in the symptoms of the patient. Why the ozonum is so largely indicated nowadays, at least in my practice, but I have heard from many colleagues uh, across the globe that they already tried the, the remedy as well with a great success, if it's indicated, of course. So I made kind of kind of the quote because I studied the pattern of the uh, of the previous epidemics uh, with the Spanish flu, so-called Spanish flu, but also other other epidemics in the past. And I already said in my in my articles that I'm quite uh, influenced by the work of Michel Foucault, who's the who's the French philosopher who made also quite a lot of research, his own research. Uh, about the epidemics, and not only about the somatic symptoms, because he was not a doctor, he was not a physician, so he was not able to make a proper analysis of the epidemic from the somatic point of view. But his work is really important because he shows that there is a much more about pandemics and epidemics, and it's not only the somatic expression. 
And when I came with the ozone, it was not because I think, okay, ozone should be indicated. It comes in my, in my practice because I start to see more and more patients and I was able to recognize certain pattern uh, uh, and certain symptoms which are clear indication from my perspective for ozone. So, and it's not new idea. It's completely not new idea. I already showed this picture. It comes from the, from the Bernard Bear. It's, it was written or published in 1869, and you can see what they already wrote down. So the old masters already know. I start to call uh, ozonum a genus impactus, because I found out historically, as well as during this particle coronavirus epidemic, but this you remedy, do you hear me? Well, can you remove that colored pencil um, thing? Oh, at the sorry, bottom? Yeah. sorry, you should tell me. <laughs> I'm, I'm getting sorry. lots of requests. Yeah, sure. Because Is it, it better it, now? No. It's it, all it's off. The, that's it. That's, that's it. it. Thank, yeah? you. Thank you. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> so, uh, I don't think it's only one remedy in such large extent, but I found it in the ozonum. So I start to call it genus impactus, and it's kind of variation for uh, uh, genus epidemicus, we know already from homeopathy. And this term comes from the Hahnemann, but he borrowed it already from the ancient Latin uh, authors, who knows the connection between pandemics, epidemics, and the bad air. And the word malaria also comes, Italian word malaria comes from it. It means bad air, mal air, bad air. So I already started to prescribe this remedy in a large extent, and then I have a, a great results. And of course, some cases need an extra support. And I hope I will show you which, what kind of remedies I think it's, are indicated or I have my personal experience with. This is just general picture about about the virus and then I don't think we need to read it again together because we already heard many times okay this virus is specific because there are spikes it looks like crown we know all of that yeah because it's every time every day news are reporting the same but what is interesting that we have a kind of rubrics in our repertory and one one rubric is uh, delusion imagination coating around him he has, and there's ozono. And it's interesting to see the connection. I'm not saying that that's because of that, the coronavirus uh, can respond to ozono, but it's interesting connection. But what I, can, what I found, and it's something similar to what Antoinette already told, that there is some, some structure. There, is a, there, is, there are some common expression and metaphors from a patient who suffer from coronavirus, or are exposed to situation of pandemic restriction and everything. And then there are three things, and there's a bubble and spikes. That's what I, what I pick up from my patient. It's like, it's, it's running through, through, the, through the pandemics generally, and not only for those who are infected by the virus. This is from the Facebook actually. So you can read from many, many interests which, will up, which, are, which are there that the people are not completely happy what, what's going on in the world. And then many people feel, okay, that's not right. This is not normal. But from the, from the news and from governments across the whole globe, we, we hear, okay, quarantine is, is necessary. It's only solution for everything. Social distancing, peace keep apart at least six feet, and so on and so on. Safer home, greater good, new normal, you know. But what is really new normal? Is this, is this vaccination mandate? Is this global government, which they try to sell us as a, for, for the greater good? I don't think so, I don't think so. And you can, you can see there are many, many issues which are closely related not to somatic expression of coronavirus, but are closely related to the whole global situation. And that's why I call ozone the global remedy or, or remedy of the uh, genus impactus. There's something that simply this somatic 
disease has such social, political, economical, ecological, and I don't know what else, impact to the whole society globally. Not just one country, not just one, uh, one part of the globe, globally, completely. So my, this is actually for my daughter because she loves this movie and it's about the two, two young uh, people who fall in love together. And the, the movie, uh, the name of the movie is Five Feet Apart. So I crossed it and my, I made a six feet apart, what is recommended. But actually there is no any study, any, any, any evidence, I mean hard evidence, that six feet is better than three feet, or one feet is better, or to mix together is better, or not to mix. You know, it was invented by the politicians, less than scientists. There is no any scientific background, unfortunately. Of course, in our idea, in our imagination, we understand that there is probably a good idea to a little bit keep distance if somebody is, is not healthy, is, is ill with some infected disease. Of course, that's true. But why six? Why not five? What does it mean? And I call this uh, cystic normal because we are, we are packed in the bubble. Again, this cyst, this, this bubble around us. And that not only on the personal level, because it's kind of layered. There are layers of the separation. For separation, you need to wear the mouthpiece or face mask. Next separation, Behind your door, you can go outside because you are home isolated. There is another separation, you know, on national level, there are bubbles, national bubbles, because you can't, you can't cross the borders and, and it goes on and on and on and on. So it's very, very interesting to see what, what really means physical distancing and this, this disconnection from other people, from the common humanity from the friends and families and so on. So this is, I suggest some remedies, but you know, just don't look at, at these for now. I mean, pestinum is very interesting. Botrops, atrox I use in my practice as well. And there are other remedies. This is the simply the idea of the bubble, which is not generated just by the remedies like uh, uh, matridonal remedies. There are much more remedies which, which have this psychodynamic or how we call it, vital force dynamic. So there are much more remedies which simply describe in, its, in their action this, the bubble and spikes. And the, the, the metaphors I hear quite often from my patient. You know, and as you see, it's, a complete, it's again on the new idea because this, uh, this nice magazine, uh, it's from uh, 60s, 1963. And definitely Ozonum has this kind of feeling that he's in, in, behind a transparent layer or behind the transparent curtain. He's divided from the environment, from the friends, from family, and so on. So this is more elaborated the idea, and I, I start to call it spiking bubble. Please don't, because we don't have much time. It's the, it's the whole phenomenon I, I really elaborate quite a lot in my practice and I was interested why it's coming on. And what I'm showing here, it's actually the physical explanation. It's, a, it's a from physics. So even the physics are able to, to try to find somewhere something which is not only on the metaphorical level when my clients were speaking about it. And when you see the global situation about the separation like if in the bubble. And what is interesting here, much more than this uh, description, which comes from the physics, it's uh, this description. Uh, as, as you know, some patient, it's a very, very low percentage of patient, they, they describe the symptom uh, kind of fizzing under the skin. They, they have the feeling it's, it's like a champagne. It's like a champagne under the skin, some electrical paresthesia, something simply wrong we did, and I found out that ozonum covers this very well. It's not this large, big bug, bug, bubble of isolation I described uh, because of home isolation, because of face masks, because of all of this globally. But it's also on the when you go from the macroscopic to the micro to the microscopic, you will you will find that 
the bubble is still there. The symbol of the bubble or the expression. And I made some, I made some addition to the repertory and it comes from my ozonum patient. So you see they have the bubbles under the skin. They can have this feeling they are in the bubble completely isolated from the environment. And this, you will, you will, I will repeat this many times during my presentation because many remedies which I found uh, complementing the action of the remedy have the same psychodynamism. It means there is bubble somewhere. We were talking about the mouthpiece and actually there is a very, very interesting, interesting uh, history when people were put the face mask on, on their face with a completely different reasons. It was not because of the infection. And for example, it's known that in the African slaves, they put the face mask to make, make them not to eat, not to eat dirt, not to eat, not to eat the uh, earth. And maybe they were as a practical reason or pragmatical, for example, in Brazil, because they were mining the, mining the gold. They were not allowed to eat it because they can recover the gold afterwards from the faces. And then we were speaking, and Dr. Farouk Master was speaking about the dirtiness. We heard uh, also from the, the first presentation about the Arsenicum album that the dirtiness and some kind of fecal pollution is in some way intermingled with, it's, it's interwoven in the context of coronavirus, about the dirtiness, washing the hands, and so on. So I put some remedies. Formica rufa is known in homeopathy very well, but there are other remedies. And uh, I really like the Solenopsis Invicta. It's a fire ant, and some patient, not only, not, only the, the, not only the fizzing under the skin, but some, it, again, it's a very tiny percentage of the patient, develop the feeling of burning, burning skin. It's a part of the co complete picture of, of coronavirus patient. So there's, a, there's an interesting, if you, if you remember the previous slides, when there was the lady holding, I will not be enslaved. I'm not doing this because it's orchestrated lie. And that there is some component which is not somatic component. I mean the infection itself, but how the politician reacted how they responded, how the governments responded, what are the restrictions, are the restrictions necessary, why vaccination mandates, who, who will profit from it, is it Bill Gates, is it the World Health Organization, who will profit with, from that, you know, and I don't want this, I don't want to be enslaved, enslaved by all this regulation, and I found that the, the armed remedies generally, not only for Mika Rufa, is, is quite good if you find kind of this uh, psychodynamism in the case. You can, you can start to think about the armed remedies. We have a very nice story. It was elaborated many times. In a, uh, many times it became a best, bestseller. Uh, it was about the, <clears throat> about the village in the in UK, uh, in Derbyshire village when they self-isolated themselves, they sealed themselves off completely. And then there are many, you know, romantic ideas that they did for the greater good and they did it for other villagers around, surroundings. But actually the later studies show that it was, it was imposed to them. It was enforced sacrifice. And first, what is important, first couple of months, the transmission of the, of the, of the disease, of the, of the black death, of the plaque, was actually through the typical, what we, what we usually know when we think about the plaque, rats, dirtiness, fleas, and then you are infected and you develop the disease and you die quickly, and it's called black death. But actually, the epidemiologist made a very nice study of the previous, uh, previous patterns. And then they see that after a couple of months, there was, sharp increase of the deaths in this, in this isolated village. And they found out that it was because the transmission from rats, this so-called zoonosis from the animal to the humans, stopped to be the case. 
and they start to infect each other in this close environment. So it means after a couple of months, if this quarantine or isolation continues, it becomes more dangerous than if they release this isolation. Because when they release in the right time, this, this uh, imprisonment, let's say, they will probably uh, will not be infected by the human to human contact via the droplets. So it's, we, should, we should think about this because it really comes from the scientific studies. I, I borrow it from uh, these conclusions. I borrow from the studies I, I uh, read before and during the pandemics. So this is my impression. Okay, when they did these lockdowns, when they did, did this uh, uh, home isolation, everything, maybe at the beginning, nobody knows how to work. You know, it looks like very deadly virus and so on. At the end, it's not. It's not so deadly. It's awful. Definitely, it's awful. It's tragedy. It's tragedy for many, many lives. It's tragedy for the whole world because of the consequences and sequelas. Sequelas? Sequelae? But generally speaking, sometimes the flu behaves more deadly than this, than the coronavirus. And uh, if we continue, this is my opinion, and the Aeon Village is the, is the example. If we continue to hold on on the strict isolation of the strict quarantine, what will happen later on that it can become more deadly than it is now? We, we mentioned rats, and then actually uh, the rat remedies are very important, very interesting remedies for the consumerism. We live in the consumer society. I mean, we are overeating ourselves, I mean, generally, uh, with, the, with, the, with the goods we, doesn't, we don't need, with the food we need. And you will find this, this uh, in, a, in a rat, in the mouse remedies, let's say. I also put the... This symbol, this is an Asclepian rod, and th this animal is actually Elafe longissima. This is known in hom homeopathy as Elafe longissima. It's non poisonous snake. And it, this is the new, new, new name for it, new Latin name. But actually, this is quite widespread snake in the Europe. And the reason for it was that during the Roman times, they browed the snake together with them, and it was like a cat nowadays, because the snake was designed to uh, keep, uh, to watch uh, the crops and everything, and to kill these rats, because they already know there are too many rats around, the disease always follows. So actually the symbol of medicine, there are many theories about what does it mean, and about the mosse, the rod of Moses is also probably, or there are different different theories. But this theory or this hypothesis about how the symbol of medicine developed, it, it simply I found it most most appealing. I, I I trust this theory. So it's actually because how the Romans keep the snake. There was the rod. There was the rod in the in the earth. There was a little nest for the snake. They have many, many rods around because this snake, Elafe longissima, is you know, moving, it lives on the trees as well. And this, this is probably, uh, this is most likely the, the cause why the medicine has this symbol together. What is interesting, and I would like now to start to connect the picture of the somatic picture of the, of the disease with something more larger, with the, with the ideas, and with, the, with my experience with, with the COVID and the pandemic, not only somatically infected people. And I found in the one, one news that because of the lockdown, there are many, many rats hungry. And not only people, but rats too. The animals, they, they used to have this uh, fr frequent and uh, regular income of the food because of the McDonald's, Victor, all these, all these uh, franchises, which actually have a lot of rest of the food, a lot of the rest overs, leftovers. And now it's not because they are closed, the business are closed. Now no restaurants open. So 
the scientists find out that many, many rats start to be more aggressive as they are trying to find some food. How it's connected with the, with the, with the plaque? I actually find out that the, pet, the, the main stream, it is not only one, but the mainstream, you know, face mask, everything. This is the, just the symbol, not, but I don't mean just because of this, because of the face mask. But there are a lot of, lot of things which, which clearly shows that possible miasm of the coronavirus is black death. It's the pestinum and the, the remedy and the nozzle is pestinum. And I put much more remedies actually for that. Because from, from my perspective, the miasm is psych, psychosomatic, dynamic, whatever global things, which covers much more, much more infection, specific infection. And I will talk about it later as well. So as, as I mentioned already, this is a French philosopher, and then they were, he already talked about the political dream of the plaque. And then you see this, this keyboards we, we already experience is a strict division, you know, separation, distancing, complete hierarchy, you know, mask, you know, and so on and so on. And you know the story about the pipe, uh, Piper uh, of, of Hamlin, about children involved, rats involved, and the disease involved. Again, I made some uh, ads on to repertory because some Osmanian patients reported me the plaque. They were talking about the 10 plaques of the Egypt. They were talking about this, how they see that the disease is hiddenly, secretly jump, rampaging around, you know. So I made a kind of revision of this plaque, which is called Black Death, originally. And I found out that because the disease itself and the bacteria itself is evolving. It's evolving. So from my perspective, it seems that the plaque is now my so-called white plaque, you know, because the blackness still inside is blackness, but it's covered with the, with, with the pretension, with the pretense that there is something which is not clearly said or which is not expressed how it is. It just appears as it is good, good, greater good for everybody. Distancing is greater good and everything. And it, you see that it's not the case, that there are a lot of, because for example, in the UK, if I, if I can mention this, they found out, and it was really just uh, two weeks ago or one week ago in the news, that they found out when they count the deaths, that the deaths which are uh, directly connected with the COVID are less regarding the old people than the other diseases. And because of the lockdown, because of the self-isolation and quarantine, all this regulation, actually many old people die because of insufficient healthcare, because they don't have a proper access to the healthcare. And then England published this, and then they see, they, it seems that there are more deaths related to insufficient healthcare than to COVID. So, uh, we know already, the same is now with the whole World Health Organization. There's a less trust what they, what they are saying. They are always speaking about the greater good, greater good. But actually, the president of Madagascar, he decided, okay, I don't want to be a part of uh, WHO anymore because they are just imposing a vaccination to us. They don't listen when we raise our voice and I don't want it anymore for, for my people. So the Madagascar president decided that they will not be part of the, the World Health Organization because there is something unclear. There is something in the fog. There is not, there is, it, it appears like, oh, oh every, everybody will just profit. But then you find out on the internet and everywhere that there is just the hidden profit for some particle people and you again i'm just repeating some remedies and i'm adding some which has something to do with that what is interesting is for example the iridium metallicum and i will speak about it later as well but other remedies <clears throat> like cryptococcus neoformans which was already mentioned by bob blair and he has a very great success with it 
in his practice. So actually the pestinum uh, was already made by John Henry Clark, I mean, our Clark, I mean, in the, the old master. And, uh, but in our country in 2005 in Czech Republic, the pestinum was reproved by Josef Stefanik. And here are some symptoms, which is quite interesting. And I found out that some people are suffering from it. And I already heard from uh, Dr. Farouk, Farouk, Master Farouk, that he mentioned that after the patient who already were a long time on, uh, on the drugs, on ventilator, they have this feeling of unreality. They, they are afraid of death. They are afraid of, of uh, they see that, that people everywhere, that everybody is dying news are supporting us with this idea that always somebody is dying and when you compare with the carcinoma deaths when you compare with other disease who are so who every day uh, kill people for example in czech republic every 20 minutes every 20 minutes one person died for carcinoma for for the sequelae of the of the tumor and you never hear in the news you have never heard in the news that they will support you with this type of information every day. Like, like you watch some news and then every time they will jump a pop-up window saying, oh, Mr. Green has died because of the, of the tumor. But what they are doing now, they are doing the same, but with the COVID only. Why not with other diseases? It's interesting. You know, they're supporting the idea that that is everywhere. It's deadly, it's deadly, it's deadly. Of course, for some people, it's deadly. And it's tragedy. It's tragedy. But not for everybody. And it's just very, very small percentage of people who really need ventilator and who develop the severe disease and potentially uh, multi-organ failure with the, with the consequence of the death. The remedy pestinum is very interesting from this point of view because it's very good for septicemia. And I will show you in the in the original picture of the disease, why it's related. And I, I would like to show you this eruption vesicles. And there's another rubric in the repertory which comes from this proving. This is the vesicles on the feet and on the palms. And there is also bubbling sensation, as I mentioned already, as you see. And what was said that many patients have, the thing that they have a chucking, choking, constricting, swallowing, and swallowing uh, aggravate, or they have the feeling that the, that, the, that the clothes are too, um, too tight. And it's not only the snake remedies. And as you see in repertory, there are many, many much more remedies which have this feeling. And the pestinum is one of that. <clears throat> Here's a quite short summary from, from Josef, who wrote that the remedy is from his perspective about, I'm completely shocked what's going on around me. I only see dead people. Everybody's dying. Uh, it's like, like if I'm in the dream, I can't believe the situation that it can happen, but it actually happened. <laughs> it's our reality nowadays in some way. So from Giuliani, this another great homeopath from the French homeopath uh, last century, he also made a Another remedy coming from the Yersinia pestis, because Yersinia is the bacteria responsible for it. And he also wrote in his, in his short book, it's for toxic infectious states, cutaneous or pulmonary. There are septic emias. And what is very important, he wrote this, severe form of influenza of pulmonary type with hyperemia, Hyperemia means uh, that the water is retained in the lungs. And of course, for example, ozono, if you look in the repertory, there is the feeling the, he has the water in the lungs. But this is the, not the only remedy, of course. As you see, there is a pestinum or serum yersinia. And then they did, uh, in Germany, they did a study. They, they did autopsies of people who died, they directly died of the coronavirus. It means that there are people who suffer severe SARS of the lungs. They have the multi-organ failure because of the sepsis, because of the severely, severely affected lungs, and then they died because they, they suffocated, and they have complete derangement of the, of the bodily function. 
and they cut cut the body autopsy and they found out that the lung was twice or three times heavier than the normal lung so that it means there was a lot and lot of water inside so you can you can find these studies on the internet or if you have access to uh, medical databases uh, i mean allopathic medical databases you can read the studies it's from germany and i can send you a link uh, later on if you, if you are interested in the study so there were at least 19 patients they did the section and then find this so it must be related all together this pattern what we are encountering what we encounter now it's simply related from my perspective to uh, to this nozzle yeah this is very important acute toxicosis of babies and of course there are many many uh, gastrointestinal diseases and symptoms i will show you something yeah this is this is elaboration of the idea i'm repeating some remedies i call it black bread actually and the reason for it as i show you already in the am village if you remember so of course there is a bubonic type of this is not uniform disease don't don't think that the the, the uh, black that the past that the sorry that the black death is a uniform disease it's not there are some epidemics when the bubonic form it means the form when you have very large packets of limbs it's like a, like an egg you know under your armpits or sometimes in a inclinal region and of course it's also deadly so this is the overreaction it's complete overreaction and a, and a fight of the lymphatic system but there are other there are other type of epidemics of the uh, of the black death which the most important thing is septicemia and it means you can see on this picture you know it can develop in two days in two three days you can develop this when you have black death when you have this septicemic form because your arteries will clock inside and there is no circulation there is no oxygen to your tissues and you quickly develop this type of course it's deadly yeah that's why uh, you know, the infection of yersinia pestis it's called black death this is because of this of this type of reaction so there is a hypercoagulation there is a hypercoagulative state and as we said before these two types are usually transmitted by the uh, by the red flag red flag uh, red sorry by by this animal <clears throat> But what is most important and it's not so it's not so much known because when you when you don't when you don't study infective disease in deep you just think okay rats fleas humans but what is important is this pulmonary form of plaque because it's airborne airborne disease it's uh, it's it's come from droplets it's come from human to human contact and uh, as you as you see there is a copious expectoration of water is Putin. So the, really lungs are overwhelmed by the water. And there is a high fever, breathlessness, and that you, you end up with a heart failure. Two, three, four, seven days maximally. And it's over. It's very deadly disease. It's deadlier than the, the previous one, the pulmonary form. Okay, very infecting complication and it was in the uk as well as in the in the canada and the new and uh, usa reported the, the symptom related to coronavirus they initially told okay it's probably kawasaki disease or it's kind of toxic shock syndrome and since the beginning of the year maybe february march they they were talking about kawasaki but when they look in the numbers they say oh it's strange it doesn't fit to the pattern we, they were treating initially uh, as a Kawasaki disease. They were treated like that. But they, later on, they found out it's not Kawasaki at all because there are some distinctive uh, laboratory findings and something else. And then they start to call this uh, uh, multisystem inflammatory syndrome in children. Of course, there, there is some overlap with other diseases. But what is important, and we, I already saw it, and uh, I think Massimo Mangiello Vori also described when he when he said that he's treating his patient with lobelia purpurescens and quinino muriaticum and other, other other remedies glindaria robusta he said that he observed high fever which was resist and i have for example my case i present this as the first case case number k uh that was the same situation 
uh, it was 12 years old girl who suffered from severe cough, she was breathless and so on. At the time, we, were, we don't have a test for coronavirus in our country. So she was not tested at all, but all fits together, all fits together that she, she suffered from coronavirus. And I, I prescribed her ozonum and she was already in recovery phase. But this was the symptom. It was high fever, resistant to paracetamol, to ibuprofen, to all the, uh, all the uh, antipyretics. So as you see, this is the famous patient because it was, uh, it was published in the, in the newspaper, Bertie Brown. There are much more patients like this, children, you know, strange red things everywhere. If I go back, before you develop this, you have the, you have the red face because before you develop this, it's only red because the, the tissue start to necrotize. It's not yet necrotic. This is the end, end stage. There are some similarities. There are some similarities. And I put some remedies, for example, Heracleum mentagasianum. They, it's, it's photosensitive uh, plant. We have it quite a lot in our country and it's very invasive plant. Nobody wants it. And then, uh, there were cases reported because when you, touch the, uh, when you touch this plant, you can develop blisters and you develop something like this rash. It's very toxic. There are other, other substances like uh, um, medusa or you know, this type of cnidarians. When you touch in the, in the sea the, the medusa, then you have immediately, you are toxic immediately. Eh? You have the, the skin rash and an urticaria, and it's very burning. And that's what it's described. That it's, it's, it's like a fire. They describe that the skin is like in a fire. That's why I mentioned the Solenopsis invicta as a possible remedy. But of course, it's well covered by the pestinum, and the symptoms come from the disease and also from provings not only from Clark's, but also from Giuliani and from Josef Stefanik. You have uh, Heloderma butus australis, very interesting, because there is the fire coming into the veins, and you will see that there are much more other remedies which will probably cover this. Uh, there, is another, there is another very, very strange symptom which belongs to the coronavirus. Again, not everybody, because most patients, if they are positive for coronavirus, are, or they are, some are not tested even. So, of course, the adult had the pulmonary form. But the increased risk, and some, some studies show that the risk is 20 to 30 percent for critically a patient to develop some kind of clotting. And as you see on the CT scan, there's the heart, and then you have the, uh, there's the aorta, and here is the... Uh, column of vertebrae, and you, you see they are clotting inside the pulmonary circulation. So it's, it's severe complication of the uh, treatment, ventilation treatment of COVID patient. And already it was told that the, the, the remedies, like uh, snake remedies, are very much helpful in this situation. But not only this, pestinum number one. If I, if I can speak from my own experience, so the Botrox Atrox is the one who works very well if you have congestion of your lungs, if it's more in the upper parts of your lungs, not, not the basal part. If you can't take breath, you feel completely constricted and, and the lungs are completely congested with the water and the thrombi and everything. So Botrox Atrox works fine. There are other medications. Um, please understand me. I'm not putting a whole list of medication to any of my slides. It's just the kind of you know tip or recommendation, and with some of them I have a personal experience from ITU or from ITU patients or from my own practice. Okay. I try to make it more general. What I have found, and this idea was maturing inside of me couple of years and especially during this pandemic when I study more and more all the epidemic pandemic and epidemic patterns in the history I would like to say that for me what is usually defined as a miasma and it's usually connected with the particular nozzle for me of course the uh, the yersinium or the black dead miasm is connected with the pestinum with the nozzle from but not only because uh, 
already there are some epidemic studies which shows that not, not all epidemics, epidemics, epidemics in the past, which were assigned to be a black death epidemics, were actually black death. Some belongs to bacillus anthracis, some belong to other diseases which appear like black death. For example, like I show some symptoms of COVID. So for me, the miasma, it's kind of, kind of umbrella, it's a global term, and there is a kind of dynamic pattern. It's not the infection itself, it's the dynamic pattern which globally, globally affects many individuals, many people, and maybe not only people, also plants and animals, as I show you later. So it means for me, miasma, it's not like if you have carcinoma, carcinomatous miasma, it's only car the nozzle is only carcinogenic, not at all, not at all. The same is with the plaque, and the same is with other other like tuberculosis miasma. And then maybe you know that Louis Klein is a Canadian homeopath. Uh, yeah, he wrote a very nice book about the miasmas, and his concept is in some ways similar to to mine, to my understanding. So it means he put under uh, under miasma also other other remedies and. That's what actually Hahnemann did in the past. When he said, okay, it's psychotic, maybe there was just two years initially, but there are much more remedies. When we are talking about the plaques, I would like to show you that really there is something in the air. There's something in the air, and that's globally we are affected. We are affected globally, but not only somatically, like because, because of the, this is just, small percentage of people who acquired the coronavirus and it's very interesting in the sweden they they make the you know in the sweden they are quite free free will they don't have a proper lockdown they just have some little adjustment of the of the public life but people were communicating to each other and so on so this is the especially sweden is the example and they and then they developed the idea in the, in the two, two months three months ago okay we rely on the herd immunity but it's interesting that when they did the testing last week it comes uh, last week the study they found out that only seven seven person people is already infected so they are free there is no isolation there is no lockdown and only seven people develop the antibodies there is something strange simple what we are doing generally here it's it's probably not fitting to the epidemic at all so I'm not talking about it much, but definitely the fire reason we will have much more trouble. As if you remember, if the ozone ecosystem is disturbed, pandemics always follows. This is my quote, and I would like to say that this pandemic, it's not the linear, linear, uh, it's not the caus uh, it's not causative moment, but it's contributing moment that we have the wildfires in Australia last year and in Siberia every year, and it's become worse and worse and worse as the global warming is worse. And then there are these 10 plaques, you know, there's a red water and amphibians, and you can see locusts and fires, all of these. This is just the mythology, or you can perceive it as a kind of witnessing if something wrong. Fires, ozone, why ozone with with fires it's it's very easy if you understand the chemistry and what's going on you, you will find this is this is our new normal actually our new normal is is fires is wildfires of the of the forest or deforestation in amazonia and everywhere in the world and what's going on when the, the wood is burned always ozone there many many clouds you know in the atmosphere always ozone there Nitric oxides means again ozone because there is a very complex chemical and physical physical reaction in the atmosphere. So this is not good sign. Actually, this is not this is what I would like to say. We are treating somatically patients who are affected by the virus, but who is not affected by the global situation, by the global warming, by the wildfires. We are all affected because it comes really far away. You can watch the NASA NASA uh, photographs from the uh, from the space from the from the satellites, and you, you see all these smokes everywhere. And there were studies done in China. There were studies done in Italy, and these studies clearly show whenever they stop the industry, whenever they stop the uh, transports transportation, 
that immediately people start to recover much easier from the viruses because they found out that these tiny, tiny particles which are in the air, which are kind of the smoke, you know, coming from the wildfires, from the industry, coming from the transportation, coming from everywhere, all this dust and little particulates, we call it particulates, they are actually the vectors, they are the, uh, the vectors like vehicles for the virus. So the virus can spread even in the atmosphere, they can spread much easier, not only droplets, you, you come, this is not the best way how to, how to you know, spread the virus. But if there is a vehicle and the wind is coming and this vehicle is spreading everywhere, so this is the problem, this is the real problem. We, we, we need to do something with it, otherwise we will give homeopathic remedies, we will do antibiotics if we believe in allopathy, we will do ventilators for our patient, we will do ITU care, but there are global, global, global uh, problems and we need to address it, otherwise we, we will end up, what Hahnemann already said, if you have the, the con continuous uh, triggering cause, like somebody live like if somebody lives in a, in a cellar and there are molds on the wall and he's coming regularly say oh doctor can you do something for me and you find out that he has asper aspergillosis because of the molds somewhere and he suffer again and again and again with the respiratory tract infection with the pneumonias because of the molds and one day you say okay i'm not giving you anymore the, the homeopathic remedies it's not working anymore probably I'm not giving you more antibiotics. You simply need to change where you are living. You need to go from the cellar, from the place where it's full of pollution, and you need to find a better place. Otherwise, it's pointless to treat you. So, but we are coming to, to more remedies which are related. Uh, I don't know if, if you know exactly what, what is, yeah, that's important. Look. This is completely different cause. When we were talking about the Black Death, but the, the end stage looks pretty similar. In this stage, carbon remedies are also quite good. What is not known, that the ozonum itself is Jekyll and Hyde. If it's up in atmosphere, it's a good guy, yeah? It's a good guy because it's shielding us uh, against the ultraviolet uh, radiation, but if it's, Inside here, if it's tropospheric, it's, it's not good for our, for our breathing and everything. What I found out, because I work as an urgent medicine doctor, and I'm working in Tehran, I'm not uh, in the hospital. I'm ambulance, you know, uh, emergency medical service. Simple. This is one of my main job, and I'm also doing the ITU work in London. What I found out, that if you have inhalation trauma, could be sporadic or, epidem uh, or ma mass casualties, Really, ozonum is one of the best indicated remedies. If you start to have the black sputum because of soot you inhaled and you have troubles, ozonum definitely helps the people. I, I have the chance to see. There are many, many, I call it, you know, the arid matter. It means that you have uh, main symptoms in the case is, is a dryness on the skin, dryness of the mucous membranes, dryness of the eyes, dryness in the nose, uh, feeling that you, you can't really open. It is very, very, it, it's part of the ozone picture, that is a dryness. And it it's, comes together with, from the toxicology even, and you can find it in the repertory from the proving, which was done in the 90s by Anishade. But actually the remedy was known to all the homeopaths as well, and the Clark, made some entry, you know, and many others made the entry into the repertory because they use ozonum much more often. And then this remedy was forgotten as many other very good remedies. Yeah, it was uh, simply we, we found something in homeopathy and then we forgot that we have uh, a treasury with us. So, and I found out that sometimes there is the emotionally dry mother in my ozonum cases. So that it simply, come together, you know, there is a dryness of mucus, there is dry mother, emotionally dry mother, but what we do generally to our planet, it's, we do this desert, you know. What, what we expect, what we expect afterwards, when we, when everything is dry, so rain is hot, there is no enough moisture, what we expect, are you going to read smoothly afterwards? Not at all. 
and even if you are not asthmatic, even if you are not, uh, somebody who suffers from the pulmonary disease or, or uh, obstruct, uh, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease or any other respiratory tract infections, you will have severe troubles. And of course, there are many remedies which are known like bryonia or sarsaparilla. You, you can see this deep crack in the skin on, on the similar to ozonum. I have a couple of patients who have crackles, uh, cracks, uh, crackled skin, sorry. Of course, aluminium salts, silicium salts, nux moshata, known for the dryness of mouth, that the tongue is not able to, you know, because there's no moisture. Skin is also uh, dry and so on. There are many, many, many more remedies, succulents and so on. We were talking about the, you know, one of the plaque of Egypt was the red, red, water become red, but we already have it on the global extent, maybe not only red, but also green, as you see. Uh, when, you, when you see Antarctic coast, coastal Antarctica, you can, you can see that is a part of Antarctica that is already green because of global warming. Just two, three degrees Celsius up, and it means that the algae start to grow in the in the snow and the, you don't have any more the white snow on Antar antarctica you don't antarctica you don't have it and you have the red sea there because there are a lot of red snow algae not only red also orange so maybe you forgot about the nice romantic picture with the nice iceland and everything and start to think about the antarctica globally affected by the climate change something rainbow, more rainbow, more, more colorful because of the algae. And uh, yeah, I found some remedies quite interesting when they, when they talk about the, the green something and so on, and, or they have some trouble to see the green, like in the people who suffer this Daltonism, uh, the disease, you can recognize red and green. So for example, dinitrobenzenum is a very good remedy for that. <clears throat> Now, there are a few algae uh, in, uh, in uh, our Materia Medica. In the plaque, uh, in the plaque, uh, a plaque of Egypt, there was also mentioned the amphibians. In the original Bible story, which comes probably from, from the uh, epic of Gilgamesh, which is Sumerian, Sumerian story about the flute and about this. So they were said that there were too, too many amphibians, too many toads, too many frogs. What we suffer nowadays, and it started, let's say, in the 80s, that we don't have enough frogs. We don't have enough toads. They are, they, are, they are dying. They are dying because of the chytrid fungus. And it's a homeopathic remedy. You can have it from Helios, for example. What is important with the, in relation with ozonum, it's not only the ecological uh, connection, but it's because the frogs and toads, they, they breathe through the skin. So if there is something wrong with the skin, with the covering, they will die because of suffocation and, or they will die because they regulate, they regulate uh, the, um, the electrolytes inside the body. They regulate through the skin much more. We have our kidneys. So if you see something like us, it's, it's simply connected and you can use you can use some frog remedies for people who have some electrolyte troubles, uh, who can uh, suffer from, uh, uh, from heart, heart failure, and also who have uh, different skin problems. And you know it from this remedy, from Bufo 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 Rana. You know that there are spots, the many, many problems uh, are spotted, and are not spotted, are in spots. The same is with ozone. It's just imagine ozone like ozone layer. If you have patient and he say, okay, my, my uh, strange eruption on the skin, it's like on the spots. It's like here, it's like here, it's like there, it's like here. It's not, it's completely irregular. There is no any symmetry. You can think about Bufo, of course, because it's known for that, but you can think about the ozone as well. We were talking about the locust as the, you know, plot, because what I think, what the Bible, I'm sorry, I need, need to calm down my children. <laughs> so I will, I will be in, in one minute here, back, yeah? Mm. 
<clears throat> okay, do you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Yeah, can I continue? So uh, we have coronavirus problem, yeah? Everybody is, uh, let's see, completely overwhelmed just by the coronavirus. But what is going on in Africa is they have the locusts and they said it's, it's the worst in 70 years. And it looks like this. This is, the act, this is the actual picture from the situation, from the situation in Africa. And there are many remedies which uh, coming from the insects which are really good to complement the cure of ozonum. We know already from the blata uh, orientalis, it's very good remedy for asthma, it's good, good remedy for some type of allergies, if you are allergic to. And there's a, uh, Musca domestica, I prescribed many times Musca domestica, and later on I found out it's, it's a, it's a rem uh, the, the better, uh, it's a, uh, the better um, success was with ozonum. Musca domestica is very good remedy for herpetic, uh, uh, for her herpes of the female genital. But I found the same with the ozone patient. They, they sometimes a lot of herpetic eruption, and especially if they suffer the vir virus, general virus, ge general respiratory tract infection, they immediately develop some type of herpes simplex virus or some ge more generalized virus. And the, the worst area is the periocular vir uh, herpes, sorry, not virus, periocular herpes. It's with the ozone patient. So Muscat Domestica, it's in some way, and you see, again, there is some dirtiness, some pollution. The same is with the uh, Locusta Migratoria. It's the remedy you, you can also get from the farmers. There is another space invasion, and then <laughs> there's, a, there's a well known remedy. It's Solanum tuberosum egratans. Some people think it's fungi, but actually, it's not fungi because there are some specific features which it's distinct, distinct from the fungi. It looks like fungi, but it's not, because there's a cellulose instead of chitin, which is typical from fungi, and the completely genetical information is stored different way. It looks like this, but there are some, some features which are, which are similar, and there is a strong element of invasion of the space, like with other remedies, like X-rays, but on completely different level. X-rays can penetrate everything, nearly everything. It's gamma rays. With Carnegie Gigante, there are some, some uh, cases in our literature. It's also used. There's a fear that the space is invaded with somebody. Of course, you, you will have the same with Locusta Migratoria and other remedies. For example, Acheroncia atropos, it's a, it's a moth. And then they suffer because there's a dream of intruders and delusion of intruders. It's still somebody is coming, harassing, pestering me. Yeah, this remedy is good for that. But I would like to talk about Solanum tuberosum because it's much known in the, in the homeopathy and you can use it for many situations, uh, especially if you have uh, the wet gangrene. Because I show you in the pestinum, that is the, the dry gangrene. It looks like mummification. And the same is with the carbon remedies. But with, with this remedy, you can, you can you have a septic gangrene. So it means it's, it's gangrene, but when it's become infected, it starts to be wet and it starts to be really nasty. This remedy is really good in this indication. Of course, it's supportive treatment because the people usually have a surgery or broad spectrum antibiotics in the hospital. But if you can help them in some way, it's better to give this at least it's together, supportive, supportive treatment. But what is important, that doesn't matter what, it's already, there was one famine in the past in Ireland, already in this, it, it, there was the exodus of Irish people to America because, because their potatoes were, were infected. But in the UK, 2005, we have another pandemic and it, it's, it's everywhere now. It's not only the Europe, it's uh, India and there are a lot of destruction of our crops. What is interesting that uh, from the, we have pole, magnetic pole, south pole. There are global changes. We are all affected. We, we can't feel it. I mean, only sensitive people can feel there are some changes. But there are many animals like birds, like insects, like uh, sea animals. And we don't know who else. They are sensitive to magnetic field and they, they use it for orientation. And we also use it for orientation. Of course, we have this uh, compass on... We are looking where is the north. 
but actually our north is drifting, it's fluctuating, it's not the same. So what you expect, if you have this fluctuation, what you expect on the global level, what's, what's going to happen? What, what, is, what, what does it mean? What does it mean for the, for the health of the people? What does it mean for the electric appliances? What does it mean for the magnetic field around the, around the, uh, around the earth, which is shielding us against the ultraviolet light? And we already know from the ozone layer that it's just a little bit less than what it should be. And we have the increased risk of uh, uh, carcinoma of the skin, of the cataracts, all of, all of the all diseases which are related to uh, radiation exposure. And I found something interesting, really, because we have this it's called northern polar vortex. It's, it's known already for some ecologists, they study it quite a lot. And I found there is the, there is the connection with the pandemic. It's, it's not only the, the pollution here on the surface, but it's about the dynamic of the northern polar vortex. Because how this vortex works, if it works uh, symmetrically, and it's really continue how the, the earth is rotating around the sun, if it works properly, we have quite stable weather. There is no tornadoes, typh typhoons, hurricanes, tsunamis, and so on. Of course, there are some other causes of it, like eruption or the volcano and so on. But generally speaking, we have much more stable weather. And we really need, if we would like to have the same environment we, we used to have in the past, we have to have a cool, cool heads. <laughs> we need to have the cool, poles of our, of our planet Earth. This is the explanation how it works. This is how it works properly. So you see the part of the Canada, there is this, this little part which is warmer, and then you have the equator, which is the warmest. If it doesn't work properly, which is here, sometimes the cold air goes down. So even to the parts like California or Mexico or other, other parts of the which is, which is cooler than it used to be. But of course, but there is no enough pressure and the warm is coming up. And it's, it's doing something with the, uh, with the glacier and it's towning. When it's towning, it's dissol dissolving the currents in the currents in the sea and so on and so on. So it's very complex, it's very complex and it's contributing to what we are actually, uh, what we are experiencing nowadays. Peter, so what does it mean, this world? Yeah, it's too much. <laughs> Peter, you are a fountain of knowledge, but it's getting terribly late in India and the, uh, and the oh, Far yeah. East now. All right. Um, so I'm, I, I was hoping to catch you at the end of a slide. People are having to leave because they're falling asleep yeah. at their computers, I think. <laughs> All right. All right. So, yeah, um, I, I expect it because it's it's really profound theme. Yeah, it, it's very profound. We we must find another way to complete this. Um, what I think we ought to do. Could the remaining uh, panelists please? Ah, um, oh, I didn't put my picture on. Yes. Could yeah, the rest sorry. of you on the panel please unmute and put your picture on? Those of you who are still here. Right. Now, Rukshin, it is horribly late at night for you. Yeah. <laughs> so what I will just ask um, is, would anybody have any quick question for Rukshin? Because it's about midnight where you are, isn't it? Past midnight, yeah, no. <laughs> yeah. Too late, too late. Um, yes, uh, Peter, while she, that we're finding that out, you'll be very glad to know two people have said, oh no, did we have to stop? Well, maybe you can, can do some more later on. I think the answer to that is yes. And somebody says, is it impossible that we've recorded this webinar? To my very best knowledge, it is recorded. Dr. Sandeep, it's recorded? Yeah, it is, it is being recorded. Sorry? Yes, it is being recorded. Yep, very good. So that will become available uh, later on. Oh, good. I can see more faces. So does anybody have a question for uh, Rukshin first? Yes, there's somebody here. Uh, Rukshin, do you use the COVID nosode for fear? 
no i haven't so far used it um also because uh, in singapore honestly we don't have the facility of uh, having a homeopathic pharmacy or a lot of uh, other pharmacies being able to deliver them medicines here so in the lockdown we've just used whatever medicines we have with us right now of course yeah of course anyway this was somebody's question coming through um okay. any this other questions Mehna. for rukshin yeah. this this is dr neha thakkar she wants to ask something yeah dr neha can you just uh, unmute yourself this is dr this neha thakkar Doctor Neha, can you listen? Can you hear me? No. Anyone else who wants to ask any question? Any anybody else for Rukshin? Because after this, we'll let her go to rest. Rukshin, there was a question earlier that um, oh, some, what something. Potency, some, what potency you would like to use uh, for ourselves? Get that. Sorry, could you repeat it? Can you hear me? No. Are Are you speaking to Rukshin, Doctor Sandeep? Yeah, I'm speaking to her. There yes. was a question. There was a question on the Facebook. At which potency would you prefer to use uh, uh, for, uh, for for our cycle? I would prefer to use a 30C to start with. 30C. Yes, always starting with a little lower potency, and then we do the five cup method. And uh, depending on the intensity, I would advise the frequency of the medicine. Any other question? There's another one through here. Is it for Rukshin? I I haven't got any more for Rukshin. Have you, Doctor Sandeep? No, I don't. No. Okay. Doctor Rukshin, thank you so much. You're most welcome. Thank you, Rukshin, for being with us. Thank you so much. But it's too late for you. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Now, um, let me look. Doctor so, Maria, wait. She wants to ask something. I'll unmute her. Question. Uh, do, who's this? Doctor Maria from Brazil. Oh yes. Yes. Okay. Um, I can't see the question. I can't see the question. Maya, unmute yourself. No, not working. She 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 has to unmute herself. Can you unmute her? I haven't got that control. Maria, you need to unmute yourself. Well, perhaps we should go to the written questions. Okay. While that's happening, uh, this uh, Antoinette, this question was asked by several people. Over what period in that one case did you give 
the placenta, the aqua amniotica, the umbilicus and vernix. Okay, I presume they are talking about the child who wouldn't go to school and then did. Uh, and I, I had imagine. Traumatic, and had a traumatic birth. So I hmm. gave that one pill of each remedy each day, so in succession. Starting off with placenta, say on a Monday, then on a Tuesday, aqua amniota, then on the Wednesday, umbilicus humanus, and then on the Thursday, vernix. So you gave one remedy each day. You took her through the, the transition within one week. The transition. Yeah. So it was exactly just one, yes. one person it was thought the transition. Yeah, okay. So uh, over a few days. Now, are there any more questions for... Yes, lots of questions. So Peter, uh, what potency and frequency of ozone are you generally using? Yeah, uh, I'm using LM1 for my patients. LM1. LM1 is a starting potency. I have a colleague who is using 12C with this Practically same same success. And, uh, um, I think, yeah, this is my starting potency. So I don't think much how it works. Simply LM daily, one drop in the in split dose, and it works. If it if there are pulmonary symptoms or respiratory tract symptoms, in 24 hours, within 24 hours, you have some uh, some improvement. Sometimes it's enough. In in 48 hours, it's usually cleared. The, the last symptom, uh, usually, uh, the last symptom who disappears is the, uh, uh, is the hoarseness. Mm. But in order, the bronchi and the lungs are relief and the oxygenation is relief in, within 24 hours. Yes. Uh, so this is a slightly uh, a, a more medical question, Peter. What would be your advice on using the COVID-19 um, vaccine once it's out in the market? Should one go with the uh, injected vaccine or homeopathic treatment? You know, I, I have the slide actually here. And I, I, can, I, can I show you because it's clearly showing something uh, very important i think we should if you'll just just put that yeah up. yeah it will, it will explain quickly the you know um this is from glasgow comma uh, glasgow uh, company they have this imagination that the there is a bubble around you with the vaccination we were already talking about the bubbles and the the COVID pandemics and the globally even the ozone is the bubble around, you know, the, I mean, the liar is a bubble around the earth. But actually, there are, there's a lot, lot of strange things about the vaccination for COVID. It's, it's generated, it's, uh, who will make the profit from it? It's Bill Gates, yeah? And some, some few people become even more richer than they are. And there is not clear if they will be the, the specifically uh, for COVID, because the, the virus itself is evolving. This is, this is the living thing. This is living thing. So I would like to say, um, I simply need more scientific evidence if it's working for people. I need the public discussion, but open public discussion, not the vaccination mandate, like enforcement, enforced vaccination. I'm not, I'm not, I'm a medical doctor, of course but I'm not for enforced vaccination. People should have the free will to decide what they want for themselves, but they should be more open discussion, public discussion, maybe worldwide discussion about the vaccination generally, about the specifically about the coronavirus. But what I found out that you can use Saracenia purpurea and ozonum, it's very good uh, remedy for vaccination and post-vaccination syndrome. If there are abscesses, you can use gunpowder, echinacea, angustifolia, or parasulfuris ostratum. The remedies are known. But I guess, especially if this is virus, like attenuated virus vaccine, saracenia purpurea and ozonum are great remedies for it. 
So this is my answer. I simply, I'm simply waiting for the hard evidence of the vaccine is really safe to give to people generally. I'm not convinced now that it's safe. Indeed, no, thank you, Peter. Um, your own sound uh, gave a distortion when you were saying how often you repeat that LM dose. Okay, I'm sorry. Yeah, daily, it's daily. What I usually do, uh, it depends on the case. Sometimes I say splitting dose. Splitting means that one drop in the glass of water and yes. one spoon every hour or every two hours. I'm, I don't have a fixed pattern. I usually leave it on the client because the client, if he's adult, he knows or she knows exactly what is the best frequency. So I leave them on them. And the same is with the allergies because now is the allergy uh, allergy period of the year. Ozone works perfectly. If it's indicated, it, it works nicely. There is alleviation of the symptom, reduction of the allergic rhinitis and conjunctivitis. So usually if this is strong, I let them to have a splitting dose. So it means one drop in the glass of water and they, they uh, drink it or use the spoon, stir it up and use the spoon a couple of times a day, uh, uh, per day. And if it's okay, if it's stable, just once daily. Mm. Thank you. Okay. I can't see. See, when I lost my internet, I lost some of the old uh, comments. I was shut out for a little while, so I can't track all the original questions. Are there any more that anybody feels desperate to ask at this stage? Now, one person has challenged, uh, under what miasm do we put COVID? I gave the answer, um, Sora um, in general, and syphilitic when it's the very severe case. He says, surely it's acute. Um, so would any of you panelists like to suggest what you would say about this? Tom, we haven't spoken to you recently what would you suggest is the miasm behind this i, I think it is uh, uh, one third in every miasm and it is a miasm itself it uh -huh. is something new this situation we never had in this world mm. it is a, an artificial disease it is made in a laboratory so it is not a, a natural disease Mm. So, and that's the reason people react different. Uh -huh. So it has every miasm inside, but something extra. So you would almost class it as a new miasmatic condition. Like, uh, the, like it is surrounded with the ozone energy, what Peter says. Mm. Mm. So the, the, the oxygen is the only thing we can exist on this world. Yes. So, and, and I think this threat. would be a beautiful prophylax as well in order Isaac Golden Mm. Or to use the um, COVID-19 vaccine? No, not a vaccine. A, a Sorry, the remedy. A natural prophylax as a homeopathic remedy. Yeah, the remedy. Homeopathic prophylaxis. Yes, the nosode. Yeah, I'm mm. very afraid about the, this new vaccine. Absolutely. And all the knowledge uh, what we have already about it. Mm. It isn't possible to make such a vaccine because never before they succeeded in a in a uh, a healthy vaccine. You you saw it with uh, 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 even there is no healthy or a useful flu vaccine. Still, mm. Mm. they say they have, but it isn't the truth. It do nothing, mm. even make the situation more worse. Mm.
And by the way, I think vaccine is uh, a big problem for the immunity of all the world's citizens. It's a big issue. We have never we had such a big amount of uh, autoimmune diseases. Mm. In a way, I'm not allowed to say it, but I say it. It is a crime to humanity. Mm. Fuck sense. Yes, indeed. Uh, okay, I can see one or two more questions. Antoinette, what potency did you use of the placenta? Uh, life begins at 40, four zero. Oh, yes, of course. Yes. Station four zero. Yeah. yeah. That's the one they worked on when they did the proving, isn't it? The idea of 40 yes. weeks gestation, yes. therefore 40 is potency. Yes. 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 Um, yeah, right. Any more questions there? I'm just looking back. Any of those that I can find. Uh, let me look under the other question list. Yes, I lost, I lost some of them. Are there any more questions anyone wants to send through? Because for some countries it's getting jolly late now. Okay. I think we should. I think we've come to the natural end. So all speakers, I will say thank you very much indeed for the work you did in preparing the presentations and for sharing such an amazing breadth and depth of knowledge with us. And lots of comments coming through. People are saying exactly the same thing. Thank you so much. I'm reading here a wonderful experience. So I think we've been four hours here, twice the time we meant to be. And I think that um, I and the hosts will say thank you very much and we'll wrap it. Several people have said what we cut off, can we complete another time? Well, I hope the management will agree to that and we can do it. Yeah. I think I can see a yes somewhere there. So, yes, we, yeah, we will, he says. So we will complete it, Teresa, another time. Whatever we've got um, has already been recorded and Peter will know how far he's got and we can continue later on. So thank you very much. And I think we will now close. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you. 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 Thank you.